afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is your host, Chris George Zuger, speaking to you live from Ottawa, Ontario. And uh, to my right across the table is Big Sexy Alex. Say hello, Big Sexy. <laughs> you have to stop doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it makes you smile every time. Um, and you have entered the Den of Lore, uh, where we talk about and learn cool shit. And today we are going to be learning that courtesy of uh, renowned author Laird Scranton, uh, who is one of my favorite authors. And we've been waiting for this show for a couple of weeks now. Very excited. Um, now when we have our opening segment, uh, I think we're just going to kind of kick it into opening segment mode briefly just to have some quick chit chat. Now, I first wanted to uh, introduce uh, Laird Scranton for any of our listeners who may or may not know uh, of Laird. Uh, Laird, he's an indep- independent researcher of Acement Ancient Cosmology and Language. Uh, he studies in comparative cosmology, uh, which has uh, served to help uh, synchronize aspects of ancient African, Egyptian, Vedic, Chinese, Polynesian, and other world cosmologies, and have led to an alternative approach to reading Egyptian hieroglyphic words. His degree is in English from Vassar College. Now, he became interested in uh, Dogon mythology and symbolism in the early 1900s, uh, or 1990s, excuse me. That's my own typo for that one. <laughs> uh, and he studied uh, ancient myth, language, and cosmology since 1997. Uh, and I would like to take this opportunity to uh, welcome a Mr. Scranton onto the air. Laird, how are you doing this afternoon? I'm very good today, Chris. Thank you very much for, for having me on. Um, I really appreciate it. Oh, well, it's, uh, you know, as I've uh, said, you're kind of one of my big three names that I've ever wanted to interview, and one of the reasons why we started this show, <laughs> so it's, 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 it's a big honor. It's a big honor. Well, thanks. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, um, how, how has your afternoon been going? Actually, it's been been a busy day. We've had, been a lot of lot of little things today, um, appointments and, and things like that, but um, uh, between that and research for new articles and things um, along that line, I have a book just out and a book just submitted and uh, another book in process. So things are, are busy. And uh, I'm the type of person who uh, can't even finish a Sudoku puzzle without, uh, <laughs> you know, without that taking a couple of weeks in between. So um, <laughs> now the, the new book, before we get into like the meat and potatoes of, of the conversation, I did want to plug the new book. Um, I bought it and then I rebought most of the old ones. <laughs> from that I have before in paperback, but they're at my parents' house and in a box somewhere. Uh, so uh, the the new book that is out and was uh, just came out in the last month, uh, The Mysteries of Scarbray, uh, the Neolith- Neolithic Scotland, and the Origins of Ancient Egypt. For our listeners, the link is in the notes. So uh, th- that was the book that just came out, uh, and you just submitted a book as well, which... Uh, can you tell us a little bit about both and how they tie together? Uh, sure. The The next book is actually, the focus is actually on the Maori in New Zealand uh, in a much later era than the Scarabray book. The Scarabray book is talking about northern Scotland at around 3200 BC. The Maori book talks about um, uh, the Maori at around 1600 AD, quite a, quite a distance in time. Uh, but there are links from the Maori to pretty much every era of uh, ancient culture that I've studied, to the languages and to the cosmology. So it's an interesting follow-on. There are actually connections back to the northern Scotland region, too. Well, that's kind of one of the biggest things with most... uh, Anybody who's looking into ancient mysteries is how everything's all connected, and people always have their own theories. Very few few people do the research and take the time to do the research. So, you know, you you, you do... uh, you do the work that a lot of us necessarily don't have the opportunity to, and uh, anything you've written it has been like it has just been so well interconnected with with tying uh, so many concepts together. It, I, I'm again coming from from an individual who has got to sit down and think this stuff out. It, it just seems so logical. Um, like how did you get into doing this type of work? Well, it was sort of by accident. I mean, my background sort of lends itself to it. Um, I have a degree in English, and language is important to this. And my uh, career, it was has been as a um, a custom software programmer for businesses, which is really a symbolic language. And th- those two things together um, are very pertinent to this study. In the uh, mid 1990s, late 1990s, my wife Risa. Um, 
passed along a book to me called Unexplained by Jerome Clark. And every chapter in this book is about some unresolved mystery of humanity. And one of the chapters was focused on a little African tribe called the Nogan, who were mysterious because they seemed to know some things about astronomy that they shouldn't know, being a modern-day primitive tribe that didn't have access to telescopes and things like that. So I um, was introduced to them through that book and then moved on to Robert Temple's book about the Dogon called The Serious Mystery and uh, sort of got hooked into it. I started following Robert Temple's bibliography and um, started to learn more and more about the, the tribe. Uh, the Dogon tribe are really excellent entry point into uh, these kinds of studies because their culture preserves aspects of three different ancient cultures. Uh, they have rituals in common with Judaism, they've got um, civic traditions in common with ancient Egypt, and they've got a symbolic system that's very similar to ancient Buddhism. Now, for when you started your first your first research, like was this something that was pre predominantly done uh, from home, or did you do much uh, much travel? Well, I was um, originally, I, I, I didn't really intend to write a book. I was keeping notes for myself and just trying to keep them organized as, as the material sort of mushroomed. I was trying to stay on top of it and keep it in the, uh, you know, a, a format that I could get back to. And after a while, I realized, you know, I have enough material here. I could write an article if I wanted to. And then a little, a little longer, after a little longer period of time, I realized, hey, there's enough material here that I could probably write a book if I wanted to. And that was about the time it started to become cheap, became, you know, becoming cheap and easy to um, self-publish a book. And so I self-wrote and self-published a book called Hidden Meanings that eventually was republished as The Science of the Dogen. And uh, so that it was sort of an, I say I accidentally wrote my first book. <laughs> You know, some of the, some people's uh, callings in life they just kind of fall into, and it just leads up, uh, you know, just from from one moment. Um, I know from like my I'm I'm a Freemason. I'm a thirty second degree. Um, I originally got into hidden mysteries when my mom handed me a Velikovsky's Worlds in Collision when I was ten years old. Wow. And yeah, that kind of reading was was. Uh, uh, kind of required in uh, in our line of work. My my sister, she went more the consciousness side with you know reading uh, reading a lot of um, uh, like a Wrinkle in Time, Carlos Castaneda's uh, series, and you know so that that whole lead up of just that one thing that just you know click clicks in your mind and goes huh that that's interesting. You just want to find out more and find out more. Um, now with with the recent book, you have you done any like I know with Scarberry being. In well north of uh, of mainland Scotland in the UK, uh, have you visited that uh, uh, that particular area yet? Yes, actually I have, but I didn't visit there until um, after the book was already written, <laughs> which was <laughs> at sort of an oh, oh no moment, you know, um, arriving on the island and suddenly it occurred to me, what if I uncover something here that totally <laughs> undermines what I've just. Uh, published in my book <laughs> but that didn't happen actually everything that that i saw there um upheld and expanded on what i had written about well that yeah that's always uh <laughs> that's, that's always a relief where it's like wow maybe this might have been a bad idea like no no we're fine but if, <laughs> if you had you could have thought of it from the side of like well now we can write a follow-up well, that's true. Um, and as time goes on, you know, there's always the, the risk that something that I wrote way back when, when I didn't have the as much of an overview on things as I do now, is going to uh, seem embarrassing. But uh, as I go back through the early books, I realize for not knowing much, I was pretty close to the mark uh, about a lot of things that, that I've since learned about. Uh, do, do you read uh, uh, like or watch Game of Thrones or have you read the uh, A Song of Ice and Fire series? Um, I'm not a, a big uh, Game of Thrones uh, fan, but um, uh, I'm familiar with it. I have, have an adult son who is a big fan, so um, I get exposure to it here and there, sort of by osmosis. Well, one of the interesting uh, parallels that at least I would I would take between your body of work and G George R. R. Martin's, well, obviously yours is, and I know that Alex, you're looking at me like I'm kind of like, where, where are you going with this? Uh, <laughs> you know, George has written um, books that are like several, some are, are thousand, you know, a couple thousand pages long, or at least a couple hundred over a thousand pages long, and he's created such a, a massive world that uh, the amount people have to cross uh, cross reference. Uh, that he actually has, a, that he double checks information with other people to make sure that what he's writing is actually correct because <laughs> he's written so much information down. It's, 
uh, the fact you can do that yourself is is impressive that to make sure that it's consistent <laughs> Well, um, actually, as time goes on, my books end up becoming a resource for myself because it's easier to find a reference by looking it up in my book than it is to try to think back to now which of the zillion source books I have lying around or on shelves places, you know, had the original quote or the original piece that I quoted. And what was the process with, with this book? Uh, this book, actually, um, the, the last couple of books have been very, very quick in a lot of ways. Um the problem is that um, there's a lot of research that goes into writing one of these books, and you really end up with a, a, a taller stack of things you can't use, you know, references that, that you can't connect to anything than the ones that you can actually put into the book. And so over time, I have all these um, seemingly loose ends that um, don't necessarily connect right away to anything. And, and in the last two books, a piece of information falls into place, and suddenly an entire book's worth of loose ends sort of pull themselves together. Uh, the Scarab Ray book, really, the material came together in about six weeks' time. Uh, the prior book, which is called Point of Origin, came together in about three months' time. And the earlier books were more like a year and a half or two years each. And for this book, for this is the, the fifth in a, in a series, is it not? Actually, this is the seventh in a series, wow. and and the eighth is um, underway with the publisher right now, and the ninth is written but not submitted yet, and the tenth is sort of in process. And for the for for the book that that's just been submitted, you had mentioned that that was uh, dealing with uh, um, with more like the the Polynesians uh, area as well as dealing with New Zealand. Uh, that is kind of a you know kind of the other end of the world if you think about it when it comes to Scotland or at least in comparison. Yes, it seems like it is. But um, actually, I, I learned about the Maori after I wrote the first book. I realized that there were positive connections there that I wanted to follow up on. And it was always my intention. Whenever I'd wrap up writing one book, I'd uh, start work on the, the Maori book, expecting that that would be the next one. And then it, in, invariably, it would get bumped by some other new piece of information and set on the shelf, and I'd come back to it after the next book. And now, looking back, I'm very glad that that happened because it connects so well to so many different things I've written written about. I wouldn't have had the background to be able to recognize it otherwise. Now, with uh, dealing, uh, going back to uh, Scarabray and its connection with, uh, uh, you know, with, with the Dogon and as well as ancient Egypt, and this is probably getting more in line with uh, the line of conversation that we're going to have. So I'll, I'll switch the video into, uh, into actual uh, intro mode. So your video, there's I've got a nice little graphic video with you up there. So... Um, the Dogon uh, use a very, very heavily, heavy symbolized uh, language to uh, deal with their cosmology, which from I know from your own work and from uh, reading a lot of the articles that you've written, uh, that it's very, very similar to the Egyptian, if not, you know, could be potentially where Egypt got a lot of their symbolism from, like it was descended from. Um, how, how does this tie into Scarabray? Okay, well, to to get to that, I'll, I'll give you maybe a quick summary of of who the Dogon are and how they how they connect, why they're important in all this. Um, the Dogon are a modern day African tribe that they're a priestly tribe who have deliberately located themselves in a remote spot in the northwest bulge of Africa um, to try to keep their tradition pure. Um, they have a a language that's not classifiable because it really consists of subgroups of like 17 other languages. And they have, um, they put a lot of priority on preserving traditions and pre preserving the meanings of words and so forth. Um, I think that at, based on the evidence, it looks that like at around 3000 BC, the Dogon were Egyptian. Um, and we can tell that by comparing um, practices the Dogon have and at what points in time traditional researchers believe that those practices came into place in Egypt. Um, it's really uh, more important what the Dogon don't have that tells us what the time period was. The Dogon don't have a written language, and we know that that happened very early in ancient Egypt, but certainly by 2900 BC, Egypt had a written language. Uh, the Dogon have all the Egyptian calendars, but they don't have any of the, they don't have the leap year days, the five intercalary days that reconcile um, the calendars. And we know that that came in very early also. Uh, the Dogon also have a number number of commonalities with the pre-dynastic tribes. So right there at the boundary between when pre-dynastic Egypt became dynastic Egypt, you know, when the first kingship formed around 3000 BC is the era that the Dogon seemed to connect to with the Egyptians. Now, 
despite the fact that the Dogon don't have a written language, their words are arguably ancient Egyptian words. I've spent a lot of time over the course of my book series correlating um, Dogon words to Egyptian words. Now, one of the complaints that is leveled against the work of comparative cos uh, comparative cosmology is my field. That's the field of trying to learn more about symbols and myths and rituals by comparing how different cultures understand the same myth or ritual. Um, so from the Dogen standpoint, um, they, um, their uh, perspective on things is that um, each how can I explain this? Uh, just as it's possible to correlate um, a deity, let's say, between cultures, uh, there's a Dogen god, creator god named Ama, who's their hidden god. And Ama has a lot of the same attributes and, and uh, plays the same role in myths and so forth as Amen in Egypt. So we can, we based on multiple points of evidence, we can correlate these two deities with each other. Uh, Comparative cosmologists say, well, look, if we, we already have, you know, half a dozen or more points of evidence to prove that this is the same deity, then clearly their names, which are also phonetically very similar, must also correlate. Well, linguists don't like that because it's uh, a linguist tends to look at things that um, if you haven't done a proper etymology of words from one culture to another, that you can't claim that there's a relationship. But um, in this case, the, the language connects based on um, multiple meanings of individual words. It's one of the characteristics of this tradition that um, any key word of this creation tradition um, is was originally assigned multiple discrete meanings. Um, meanings, when I say discrete, I mean the, the meanings are distanced in such a way that knowing one doesn't really let you guess the others. Um, the Dogen God is an example. His name is Ama, and he, so, Ama is a hidden god, but the name also means to grasp or to hold firm or to establish. When you go to Egypt, you have Amen as a hidden god, whose name also means to grasp or to hold firm, firm or to establish. You go to Hebrew, and the word Amen comes from a root that means to establish. So you have a way of connect, interconnecting things here through language that is really important, um, and that sort of gets us uh, a foothold into the uh, Egyptian culture. So so basically, I, I can use Egyptian language to validate what the Dogen are telling me about words. The Dogen say, here's, here's our word, here's how we pronounce it, here's how we understand its meanings. And then I can go to an Egyptian hieroglyphic dictionary and find the same meanings connected to the same pronunciation. Um, so that's one of the cross-checks on the work that I do. Another cross-check is um, to the Buddhist um, symbolic system. The Buddhist system is given in an entirely different language. It's in Sanskrit, not ancient Egyptian words, but it's all the same stuff. It's the same set of symbols, the same shape, carries the same meaning as in the Dogen tradition. And so that's a second cross check, that if the Dogen say that a particular ritual or a particular symbol means a thing, I can go to, the, to Buddhism and cross check that and say, how, how does Buddhism understand this? And, and typically there's a match. Um, so all of this makes the Dogen an excellent place to start. Uh, the, re the way that this all connects to Scarabray is that the Dogen say that their symbolic system was instructed in ancient times. Um, as a matter of fact, they go farther than that. They say that the symbols um, describe how their tribal god created matter. That's sort of the first level of of statement they make, that the symbols we're talking about represent how matter forms. And I didn't know all that much about matter when I started out. I knew that, you know, about atoms, I knew about protons and electrons and neutrons. And I could I could see that the Dogen had definitions that went along with those. They, they have an atom that they describe correctly, and they have um, something called sene seeds that are like protons and, and electrons that are the components of the atoms. And so... I wondered if maybe the, dis the long descending series of stages that the Dogen described for how matter forms before that might not also be correct. And so I educated myself in, um, you know, read Brian Greene and Stephen Hawking and, and dis popular descriptions of how matter forms and started lining things up and realized you can, you can set it side by side. 
the Dogen system is so intuitive, you can lay a, their description and their drawing right next to Stephen Hawking's description and his diagram and intuitively see that you've got a match. Well, some, something like that would be very similar with how French and English would be related uh, because they come from the same source, essentially, where, you know, uh, one similar word, uh, forest and forêt, would essentially, they're the same thing. They just a slightly different spelling. One, uh, the French has a uh, uh, has a symbol on top to uh, to denote a certain way that the word's supposed to be. Um, yeah, help me out here. Pronunciated. Pronunciate. Thank you very much. Uh, so it's supposed to be pronounced, and uh, but you know, to, to to some you know, a thousand years from now or or two thousand years from now, uh, somebody could look at those two words and not necessarily think they mean the same thing. Right. And also, also, there's a problem from a linguist standpoint in that you've only got about 40 phonetic values that are being um, um, or expressed in any given language. And so the chances of the same phonetic value being used to represent the same thing are pretty great. There's a high chance of, of coincidence. And so to just say that two words are pronounced alike and mean the same thing doesn't really carry any weight with a, a linguist. Uh, it might be a coincidence. You need other evidence to sort of anchor that. But in the case of the Dogen, we've got that evidence. We have, have multiple points of evidence for every word that we make, a word comparison that we make. Now, the, the Dogen say that this scientific system that they are preserving in symbols was an instructed system. And they say, uh, I give you a little bit of background here. It gets a little bit complicated. Um, the Buddhists say that they got their symbolic system from a non-human source. That the most they flatly say that the non the most sacred Buddhist symbols were given to humanity by a non-human source. The Dogen agree with that, but the Dogen carry it a step further. They say not only was it a non-human source, but it was also a non-material source. Now, as a researcher, that creates a problem for me because it, it leads me into areas that are so controversial, it's hard hard not to get into, you know, to have somebody just dismiss your work just based on that kind of an outlook. But I'm in the fortunate position that these two systems, these two symbolic systems, were both, uh, you can demonstrate that they're ancient. You can de demonstrate that their uh, Buddhism was documented by around 400 B.C., and the Dogen system is given in ancient Egyptian words that went out of use by around 750 BC. Oh, and wouldn't something very similar be uh, possibly to be said about uh, uh, dealing with like ancient Buddhism uh, with uh, the revelation of the trigrams and how those were essentially uh, brought up on the back of a turtle and shown to a Chinese god way back when? Yes, there there are a lot of commonalities between cultures, and that that argue for um, you can you can place the a rough date on any given set of symbols like that. But because we have these two systems, uh, the Buddhist and the Dogen systems that are given in different languages, it's not likely that one of them just adopted their system wholesale from the other one. It, you'd have a far greater overlap of words if that were true, and so it looks. The systems look like two different cultures managed to keep a very complex set of symbols straight for thousands of years, independent of each other. So now when you get down to the bottom, and they're both saying that they got it from a non-human source, I can take two, two different points of view on that, one of two points of view on that. I can say, I can take the stance that they each managed to keep all of the other details straight, but somehow misremembered that one in matching ways, but it's not true they got it from a non-human source. Or I can say they managed to keep that last detail straight also, and therefore, as a researcher, I have to allow the possibility of a non-human source. And for, for the idea, like, is it possible that the uh, non-human source uh, could have been a metaphor or a misinterpretation for, let's say, a slightly more advanced um, you know, aspect of humanity? There, there are reasons why that, that can't be. The first one is that the Dogen say that the major concern of their teachers was the possible bad effects that their presence could have on the Dogen. And so to limit that, to limit the exposure of the Dogen to them, they settled on a system where they would take eight Dogen tribes people away to a, lo a remote locale, teach those eight, and send them back to teach everybody else. Um, 
that pattern plays itself out all over the world in various cultures, the pattern of the eight wise Chinese emperors or the eight um, quasi-mythical ancestors who come into a culture with civilizing skills in ancient times. Now, the connection to Scarabray comes out of that mindset because at Scarabray, what we have at 3200 BC, which is before dynastic Egypt, we have the first, what's interpreted as the first farming village in northern Scotland, a cluster of eight houses in a little, little you know, built with uh, flat stones um, that gives the outward appearance of this lo location. The Dogen and the Buddhists talk about a remote location where, where things might have been taught. Um, but that's not really the starting point for the connection. The real starting point for the connection comes out of um, architecture, that the researchers in northern Scotland don't have anything to connect the Scarabray site to. They, um, they've been studying it since the middle of the 1800s when it was first uncovered. They've had major archaeologists in there looking at things, trying to connect it to Scandinavian roots or to European roots or something. But nobody has successfully made a connection. Well, the, the original houses at Scarabray were all bit, built to a particular plan, and that plan is a match for the, a, a typical Dogen stone house. So, um, in addition to that, the, the Dogen stone house carries symbolism. It's, it's put together the way it is for a reason. There are cosmological meanings associated with the, the components of the house. The house represents essentially the body of a sleeping woman. It has a what the the researchers in Scotland called a unique feature at one end. It's a round room shaped sort of like a beehive cell. And on the sides, it has two long rectangular rooms and a square room in the center and then a sort of a rectangular entryway at the bottom. And this represents the, the body of a sleeping woman. The round room is her head. The side rooms are her arms. The central room is her body cavity. And for, in the Scarabray houses, there's actually a hearth in the center that represents the heart. So once we make that link in the architecture, now it becomes fair game to consider all of the Scarabray elements in relation to the, the Dogen cosmology and the Dogen language, which also is a, you know, that also means we can consider Egyptian cosmology and Egyptian language. Well, uh, and that, that would be similar, if I'm not mistaken, to um, at least parallel the work that would be done uh, or discovered by uh, Schwaller de Lubitz with regards to the Temple of Man, uh, the Temple of Luxor being an that's example. That's right. That, that's an important thing for, I, I'm good friends with John Anthony West, who uh, wrote um, extensively about Schwaller's Temple of Man uh, outlook. And yes, this, this pro absolutely provides a foundation for that, which there really hasn't been one before. Why why would he? Why would the Egyptians have thought to have built this temple at Luxor that seems to represent a human body, the parts of a human body? Now, the next question I have is how many times have you seen uh, Magical Egypt? Because I, I know I've seen it like about 10 times. My, my, <laughs> my wife says, it's like, oh, God, are you watching Magical Egypt again? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, I... I, I tend not to watch things that I'm in, <laughs> but I do do tend to watch things for for uh, information. The the segment there's one segment of Magical Egypt that is fo has its focus on my work. Um, that segment was filmed the day I met John Anthony West. He uh, invited me and my wife down to his house at that time. He was living in Athens, New York, and invited us down, but didn't tell us in advance that he was going to have a cameraman there to film the get together. <laughs> and so it was sort of a fresh. I guess he wanted a, you know, fresh take on the, the discussion and the information, and not having me come in over prepared to talk about this stuff. Well, yeah, I can understand that. I don't listen to our shows back after they're done. Uh, just because I like doing them, but I, the, the sound of my own voice, it's just kind of, eh. So I, I can understand that. <laughs> a lot of people feel that way. I was a musician in college, my college years and did a lot of um, re musical recordings and uh, singing, singing and playing music and things. And so I got sort of got used to hearing myself to the point where I didn't you know, cringe every time I heard myself. But I, I don't tend to listen back to the, the shows that I record unless there's a... Um, a really good reason to do it. <laughs> There's like a really particularly nice shirt that you were wearing. It's like, you just place it. You need to know what style it was, that kind of thing. Uh, but but move, moving on from from the symbolism with uh, with the 
how the houses were shaped in, by the Dogon as well as uh, in Scarabray. Uh, if we're dealing with uh, like the Temple of Man uh, at uh, the Temple of Luxor uh, with regards to uh, its anatomy, what is the symbolism that, that was derived from the curled up sleeping woman in both of those houses, or house designs? Okay. Um, this ties to um, ancient myths in a number of cultures. There's a myth in... Uh, in Hinduism uh, called the fable of the seven houses. And it's a story about how a, a goddess named Devi um, at dawn, she pays a visit to seven houses and in each house she finds um, a housewife in the midst of a, a, a performing a particular act in the house. Um, Alex, I can see you raising your eyebrows at that one suggestively. <laughs> <laughs> go on, okay, go now, on. Now, now this myth, um, okay, each of the, if you examine the, the details of this myth in relation to a, the Egyptian hieroglyphic language, you realize that each of the actions that the, the housewives are performing in these houses represent, um, how can you say, daily needs of life. Uh, there was a psychologist, I think uh, Maslow had uh, a levels of, uh, defined levels of human need where unless you had satisfied a basic need, you couldn't really think about a higher need. Well, then this is sort of the same sort of uh, situation playing out where you have a hierarchy of needs being expressed here. But they're all given in the Egyptian language based on words that are phonetically based on the root nehet. Now, net in the Egyptian language is the name of the goddess Neith. And so the, the Hindu myth, which connects other ways into Egypt, uh, in, a, in a prior book I make connections into Egypt around 4000 BC through Elephantine. Um, it's, no one really has a theory of where the goddess Neith came from. They know that um, she existed before dynastic Egypt. She, there were references to her before dynastic Egypt. But nobody knows for sure who she is. She connects in certain ways to certain Hindu and um, actually uh, goddesses out of India, uh, traditions out of India. So, okay, so the symbolism of the house links in one way to this, this myth of the seven houses. There's, there's also a myth of seven houses that comes out of the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Only in, in that version of the myth, it's not a, a goddess and housewives involved. It's the deceased spirit of a pharaoh who visits the seven houses at dawn and finds at the door of each house um, three um, gatekeepers, basically three deities or or godlike beings who are, are doing certain things or say certain things at the doorway of each house. So a couple of the chapters of the book on Scarabray deal with the relationships to those myths. Um, cosmologically speaking, the seven houses... Um, the concept of the house, uh, how can I explain this? What we have on Orkney Island is a series of megalithic sites that were connected by a Neolithic road at 3200 BC, and that road led to the Scarborough village. So we know with certainty that whoever built these sites considered them to be related to each other because they connected them. They were built cross-generationally, which means there had to be a cross-generational plan. This was accomplished over the period of like 600 years. Now, the local researchers don't know what to make of these sites, but looking at, for me, looking at it in terms of the cosmological system I've worked with, the sites recreate a sequence of shapes that are cosmological. These are shapes that, that matter supposedly goes through as mat matter forms. So there's a progression, and that progression leads to something in science that's uh, in string theory is referred to as the Calabi-Yau space. This is a cluster of seven or eight uh, collapsed dimensions that supposedly exist at, a, at every point in space and time. Well, the Dogen system, the Dogen descriptions of matter also describe that same structure. They call it the egg of the world. Um, and it looks to me like the Scarabray site was meant to represent that. That process of creation of matter, though, in the ancient traditions, one of the metaphors that's given for it is, um, in, in very archaic philosophies, the thing that catalyzes the formation of matter are two energies that come together. The first energy is 
uh, a non-material energy that's associated with a sleeping goddess. And the other energy is a material energy that is considered to be masculine. And when the two come together in the context of, a, of an act of perception, then suddenly, um, sort of as an automatic response to that, what we see as particles of matter form. And there's a transformation that happens sort of the same way that a Wi-Fi signal gets trans translated into an image on your screen when you turn your PC on or when you click on that link. That it exists originally in the form of waves, but at the point where you see it and consider it to be real, it looks like it's an object. It looks like it's a real thing or a real image. Um, so the sleeping goddess that's represented by this house is a fundamental co concept that relates to the cosmology that's being expressed there. This represents the sleeping goddess who awakens. Um, in the Old Testament tradition where um, at dawn, uh, when it's dark, um, Yah, the Hebrew god, um, who from my perspective represents the concept of, of light, he actually represents um, the initial stirrings of light that um, sort of hover over the water as the sun rises and causes the sleeping goddess to open her eyes and to awaken. So when, when Yah says, let there be light, what he's really doing is waking this goddess. And that's actually a very interesting point you bring that up. And I know every single time I bring up Freemasonry, Alex always looks at me a little bit strange, but I do it anyway. Uh, oh. <laughs> Sorry, just uh, it's we have a new sound card. I'm still getting the levels right, so if there's any distortion, I do apologize uh, from that. Um, let there be. Whenever somebody's initiated into Freemasonry, the moment that they go through their obligation, and you know, that we basically, um, you know, kind of. Uh, bust their balls as much as possible to kind of freak them out and spin them around a room. You know, it's, it's part of the bonding process. Uh, the let there be light word is said kind of at that breaking point from where they go from being in a state of darkness to having that knowledge, uh, you know, b being illuminated, the, the shroud being lifted over, and then the knowledge being presented to them afterwards. Uh, it, it's very interesting to bring that up because we use the exact same wording. <laughs> That's very interesting. Well, um, what came to my mind there was the the theosophists have uh, when you were describing how they they look at particles or matter, uh, the theosophists had a uh, a saying that went to materia is spirit at its lowest cyclical vibration. Right, and that's that's actually true. The word spirit is sort of synonymous with non-material in the traditions that I study. Um, the outlook comes out of a very archaic set of philosophies that are. Um, um, they go, go a lot farther back than, uh, or the indication is they go a lot farther back than ancient, um, the beginning of ancient Egypt. But in these philosophies, the idea is that at bottom, universes form in pairs, and that our material universe has a twin that is a non-material universe. And these two came out of twin placentas. These are siblings they're talking about. Um, one is considered to be feminine, the other is considered to be masculine. And it's the energies, the flow of energy, there's a flow of energy between these universes that is as essential to life as the natural water cycle. It's compared to, um, you know, water evaporating from the oceans to form clouds that rise up over the mountains and then create rain that flows back down through the rivers to the ocean. It's that cycle. Without that cycle, there would be no life on the planet. The Dogen and other cultures are saying that without a cycle of energy similar to that between these two universes, that there would be no life in the universe. Now, this also touches on uh, interesting uh, ideas of consciousness and, and how to be able to uh, kind of talk to that other side of, or that other universe, that paired universe. And I know Graham Hancock has, has uh, uh, extensively documented his use of uh, uh, ayahuasca to essentially, you know, when he goes when he uses it he he's contacted by these beings who are essentially there to kind of guide at least kind of guide humanity or at least guide the people who make that crossing uh to first of all teach them where they've messed up in their life and then kind of move them forward and give them some type of enlightenment um now like from my understanding and my reading is that the dogon have have used uh, at least some that like they're within that range of of africa of having used that type of mind expanding um uh, you know, something to be able to kind of like expand the mind to to, to touch onto that other wavelength. I, ibogaine, I think, is the tradition in Africa, okay. not, not ayahuasca. Okay. Uh, it's similar, but a little bit different. So, it, it, like, is this something along the same lines where, uh, you know, 
th- cultures throughout the ages have used some type of medium to uh, kind of cross over uh, to that other, or at least to contact that other, uh, as you said, paired universe. Are you asking if the well, Dogen that... get loaded or? Well, no, no. Well, I, again, we drink scotch here, so we get a different type of loaded. So it's kind of a different word, um, but yeah, kind of along those lines. Um, that's not what the Dogen attribute things to. Um, the anthrop. Okay, my, uh, the Dogen studies come out of three decades of anthropological study by the premier. European anthropologist of his day, a gentleman by the name of Marcel Griol, who was from France. He brought teams into Dogen country um, every year for uh, three decades um, and became so familiar and so trusted by the tribe that he was actually himself initiated in their esoteric tradition. He was granted citizenship in the tribe, and when he died in 1956, they gave him a Dogen burial. So this is a guy who knew the the tradition very well, and he says that the Dogen have mastery over the plants of pharmacopoeia in their in their region. They understand uh, the medicinal values, and I'm sure the the recreational values of all the plants and or, uh, organisms that are growing in their region. But that's not what they attribute this to. Um, their teachings in ancient time is described in strictly um, this is action that happens within a material frame uh, in a complicated way um, I think you had mentioned once before that the, the I mean not just the symbols coming from potential non-human source but uh, some of the agricultural concepts that they're using over there maybe we can talk uh, about that in a minute yes uh, the the plan this instructed plan is has two pieces to it um, the first piece was a civil, an instructed civilizing plan whose, in, whose purpose was to teach us how to be farmers, basically. And that civilizing plan was integrated with a, a plan of creation, a, a concept, a system of creation. And when we say creation, um, the Dogen are talking about um, three themes, uh, how the universe forms, how matter forms, and how biological reproduction happens. Now, from their perspective, those three processes are parallel processes, and they are so similar to one another that the Dogen use a single progression of symbols to simultaneously describe all three of those themes. So any when we ask, what does a symbol mean? What does an Egyptian or Dogen symbol mean? That's not really a fair question. We really have to ask, what does it mean in relation to one of those themes? because the meanings are slightly different. For example, the shape of a hemisphere, if we're talking about biological reproduction, represents an expanded womb. If we're talking about the formation of mass or matter, it represents the expansion of mass. So it's the same basic concept. It falls at a parallel place along the progression of of how this creative process happens, but with a slightly different take on what the symbol represents. so just as in biological reproduction, it begins with the fertilization of an egg, so does the formation of the universe. It begins with a cosmogonic egg. So basically, you're learning you're learning one set of symbols and then being able to apply it three times. It's a very, very efficient system. Yeah, particularly good for sustaining their culture. I think you could, you'd call that maybe a mimetic versatility or something. Yeah, it's a very mnemonic system. Um, the The structures of their daily life are there to reinforce the the teachings of cosmology it's a self-reinforcing structure arguably it's the same structure that we know with certainty survived in egypt for three thousand almost three thousand years now with with regards to um uh, you know egypt versus the dogon uh, is, is there like a clear consensus from what you've been able to find from uh, that like the Egypt and, and the Dogon were one and the same around what time was uh, was there a transition and you know they're on other either either sides of the continent so was there a migration by one or the other how, how did that work out first I have to say that there is absolutely no consensus on any of this there is nobody who accepts this stuff except me basically there certainly is no academic person who accepts these things. However, there is a growing list of, of academic 
questions that have no official resolution that are resolved by this stuff. Um, I'll give you an, ex an example. Um, I told you about the French anthropologist coming in for 30 years to study the Dogon tribe. Well, when Robert Temple wrote his book, The Serious Mystery, suddenly that study became controversial. They were taught, Robert Temple was trying to cast it as an alien, evidence of an alien contact. And that was highly controversial. So first Carl Sagan uh, spoke up and said, well, the reason the Dogen understand things about astronomy that they shouldn't know is because clearly they've had a modern visitor who told them about it. That answer stood for a couple of decades. What, what Sagan didn't think about was that the whole body of knowledge that that information comes out of is expressed using ancient Egyptian words that went out of use by 750 BC. So that's an immediate credibility problem for this modern visitor. Why would they have given it to the Dogen using archaic words. The second thing is, the Dogen are talking about the presence of a second star in the Sirius system. In ancient Egypt, myths tell us, and we know from the ancient Egyptian myths, that um, in Greek terms, the goddess Isis represents Sothis or Sirius. And to be able to say that, we sort of have to tacitly agree to play a game, a symbolic game. And the, I call the game, when you say goddess, I say star. Well, those same myths tell us that Isis had a sister named Nephthys, who was a dark sister. So we can see from the Egyptian myths that they were on top of the same information. They knew that there were two stars there. So Sagan just didn't, perf his statement was a sensible one, but if he pursued it a little bit farther, he would have realized it couldn't be right. Now, a similar thing happened with the Dogen studies, the 30-year studies that the French anthropologist did, that once the tribe became controversial, then a Belgian anthropologist, whose specialty wasn't even religion, his specialty was um, ecology, took a team back in for a few years to Dogen country to, to restudy uh, the, what Griol had studied. Um, and in anthropology, it's not uncommon for that to happen, that a second anthropologist will restudy study some piece of what a prior anthropologist studied. But in this case, the guy was trying to restudy in three or four years what Griol had studied over the course of 30 years. And Griol had described the Dogen esoteric tradition as a closely held secret tradition, the one where the, the, the central tenet of it is that if you're a Dogen priest and I'm an initiate or I'm an outsider of any kind, and I ask you a question about the tradition, as long as that question is, is appropriate to my status as a student, you are you are obligated to give me a truthful answer, but if you if the question that I ask is not appropriate to my status, you are required to either remain silent or to lie if you have to to protect secrets of the tradition. Now that's exactly the same scenario that exists in, with the Maori in New Zealand. One of the reasons that the, one of the pivotal connections between the two is that the structure of this esoteric tradition is almost precisely the same, described in the same terms by the early researchers of that tradition as Griol used. So the Belgian anthropologist goes in to Dogen country, studies it for a few years, comes back out and says that in his opinion there is no Dogen cosmology. The Dogen priests are so obliging that when the French anthropologist kept asking these questions, they just made stuff up and told it to him. It wasn't a real system at all. Well, again, we have a situation where the Belgian anthropologist stopped a step too soon in his research. He didn't notice that both, that the Dogen uh, cosmology, it, it, the grand symbol of this cosmology is an aligned, an aligned shrine that the Dogen call a granary that takes a very specific form as based on a specific plan, symbolic plan. The Belgian didn't recognize that the Buddhist cosmology is based on the exact same kind of shrine, same type of shrine. It's called a stupa. Uh, I have an adult daughter who went to India and uh, noticed while she was there that she, there were shrines all over India that that seemed to resemble to her the Dogen shrine. So she came back and she told me about it, and I did some research, and real, that's how I connected up to um, the Buddhist cosmology matching the Dogen. But because these cosmologies and the shrines match, 
it can't be the case that the Dogen priests made up the cosmology unless we're going to say that the Dogen priests casually invented Buddhism. It, it, it's not a, a credible perspective. So uh, we, we have ways of demonstrating. A, a large part of what I do is, is trying to find ways of what I call anchoring an interpretation. And the interpretation goes against what the um, academics say. I, I offered the Belgian anthropologist to co-report this new finding with him in a, an academic journal that he edited. I thought, if I'm going to going to present a point of view that goes against what his study said, the least I can do is let him share the credit for having found it. But he didn't accept the offer, and so I had to find my own academic journal to publish in. I ended up publishing a article in two, an article in 2007 in Anthropology News through the University of Chicago that basically says what I just said. The Dogen um, and cosmology has to be legitimate because it's a match for Buddhism. Now, the inter interesting thing through my research that I found uh, with regards to uh, you know, with regards to those two terms, uh, the, the Dogon and uh, their again the granaries that that you just described, uh, the, uh, the the Philistines and I believe also Sumer and uh, Babylon, uh, like thousands and thousands of years ago, they had a, a god Dagon, who apparently was supposed to be the uh, god of uh, granary and uh, of harvest. Which, right. which kind of at least sounded very interesting to me because, well, you've got the two similar, uh, similar terminologies, at refer and also you've got two uh, linking themes. Right, and that's how a lot of this stuff starts. It starts with a resemblance like that, that at the resemblances are supposed to make you think, what is this? Scratch your head and say, how could that possibly be? Don't you think there's a connection here? And then to go find a way to research it and find a way to anchor the connection. And that's sort of the entire process that I go through. It starts with resemblances. But there's a, there's an inherent problem for somebody like me. And the problem is that the human brain finds patterns, wired to find patterns. Um, and if, if you've ever, ever laid and looked up, you know, a child la lying on the ground looking up at the sky, looking at the clouds, they're their instinct is to see pictures in the clouds. They see, oh, look, there's a turtle, and look, there's a horse, and there's a dog. That's the way the brain works. And the risk for somebody like me is that you're going to go chasing off after some resemblance that looks like it's a real thing, but when you finally get to the bottom of it, objectively, there's no pattern there. It's not a match. You want causality, and what you get is a hop, skip, and a jump. <laughs> yes, that's, that's right. That's exactly right. So the trick is to try to find a way to anchor these things um, that is intuitively correct. I mean, this is a field of study where you can't prove things Mathematically, you can't prove it with statistics. You can't prove it to five decimal positions, and so you have to find some other way to demonstrate it. Um, when it comes to the structure of matter comparisons, the way to demonstrate it is side by side comparison. Um, I was taught that um, when you're researching a question in science, and you bump, find yourself bumping up against the third coincidence, it's time to consider whether something might be going on other than coincidence compounding correlation <laughs> yeah if you think if you define a coincidence as a one in a thousand chance let's say by the time you get to the third one you're dealing with some pretty heavy numbers in terms of the statistical chance that this could be true it's time to buy a lottery ticket at that point <laughs> yes so um that's a large part of what i do is as with the scar brace site trying to find a way to positively anchor two things for scar bray that the initial uh point of uh, habitation was about 5,000 years ago, so about like 3,000 plus BC. Some people have, have placed it at uh, as early as 3,800 BC. Uh, with the comparative uh, cosmology between, let's say, Egypt, the Dogon, and uh, let's say uh, sites like Gobekli Tepe, which I, I'm, I know if, if this were some other shows, people would be taking a shot right now uh, by, by, by me saying that, so go right ahead. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, Gobekli Tepe plays plays into this. As far as I'm concerned, Gobekli Tepe is the first indication we have of this system of cosmology. Uh, all the symbolism that we find there, all the symbolic elements we find there, trace forward to the other traditions that I've written about. Was there anything particularly unique about the Dogen architecture that stands out? Um, if that's one of um, Well, the... Um, the the feature that the 
Scottish researchers were calling unique was the round beehive room. But the combination of features, the fact that you have these rooms that fit together in that configuration as a body, is a, uh, an arguably um, identifiable form in itself. Uh, it's enough to make the link to the Dogen. I, I was looking at it from a, an interesting point of view. My, um, I came at this because of a question that uh, a very distant acquaintance in Australia asked me by email. They wanted to know if I thought there could be Egyptian influences in northern Scotland at Scarabray. Well, I know that 3200 BC is really too early, a little too early for that to be possible, that, that dynastic Egypt hadn't organized itself enough, even within, within itself, to, to be believable that they could mount an expedition at that point all the way across the continent to Scarabray. But still, that was the perspective I was working from, is that I'm seeing Egyptian and Dogen influences at Scarabray. And I thought, well, that's very interesting because the Dogen house doesn't have the hearth. And so when they implemented the house plan, I was thinking at Scarabray, they added the hearth, but they added it in keeping with the cosmology of the house. It sits where the heart should be. I thought that was very interesting that someone had enough perspective to do that until I got about a third of the way into my research process and realized that all the evidence I was seeing played out much more easily if I reversed my point of view, that it wasn't Dogen and Egyptian influences on Scotland I was seeing, it was Scottish influences on the Dogen and Egypt. And from that perspective, then, the Scarabray House is the original plan. It may even be the plan that the, the myth of the seven houses is talking about. And... The Dogen would have removed the hearth when they moved to a, uh, an area of the world where it was warm enough they didn't need a hearth in the house. It, it's like, why would you have a you know central central air in a place that is uh, constantly minus 20 or minus 30, which it is today here in Canada, I can tell you that. <laughs> um, it, it, it's, it's kind of interesting you say that because I, I know that like some work I've been doing uh, doing outside of the Dead of Lore has been dealing with a lot of... Uh, dealing with um, you know what, what's called like the heart, the heart bind, like how... how uh, you can gain certain wisdom or certain uh, perception by at least focusing on uh, the emotions while you're actually considering uh, uh, certain facts or certain, uh, you know, certain points of interest. Uh, that kind of at least like it kind of was a, was a touch point to me. I, there may not be any co correlation there, but it goes to the idea of wisdom and experience as, as potential symbolism. Well, in the archaic philosophies that underlie this um, system, it's understood, okay, uh, there's a description given. The, the non-material universe is characterized as having perfect knowledge, but an inability to act. And the material universe is characterized as having imperfect knowledge with full ability to act. And in that context, it's understood that routine attempts are made to um, communicate information that will initiate an action from the non-material side to the material side. I compare it to a game of charades where you can give a single clue and hope that the person gives you back the whatever the concept is you were trying to get evoked from them. Well, this is, and these, um, in the view of the philosophy, play out in specific ways. They happen um, through vivid images and dreams. They happen through what look like coincidences in daily life. You can see them through uh, unusual behavior of animals, through um, clairvoyance and divination, and through you know techniques like you were talking about, the being able to focus on an emotional, um, an emotion at the same time that you're considering a, an idea. But that from their perspective, there are active, active attempts being made here to communicate that information for whoever is viewing it in a subtle enough way to understand that that information is is being passed and pr predominantly why, why do you think that this information was being uh, was being given okay that there's an entire book's worth of foundation for that and it's a book that hasn't been published yet okay but but I can tell you that at bottom there is a sensible rationale right, uh, for how it could be that a non-material teacher would have uh, been able to act in a material frame. There's a sensible rationale for why this communication goes on. 
a sensible reason for why the esoteric tradition was created in the first place. Um, more than a sensible rationale, it's not, there's a, there is an underlying compelling motive for why this happens. And to get to it, you have to deal with very fundamental concepts of science. One of the things about the Dogen system, I said I had matched up the progressive stages of matter that Dogen have from atoms all the way down to waves. The problem is that the Dogen include several steps below that that the modern scientists don't talk about. They don't either they don't know about it or they don't discuss it. And there are drawings of shapes and descriptions of concepts that I had no scientific correla correlation for. And so part of what this unpublished book will do, probably in 2018, I, is when I expect it will be published, is it synchronizes th that mythic part of this structure of matter with science in a way that I think is coherent. And when you integrate those th two perspectives together, then suddenly um, information sort of plays out. It becomes apparent what, what the rationale was behind this, why things are the way they are. And it incorporates um, fundamental concepts from Kabbalism and from Buddhism and from the Dogen tradition in ancient Egypt, from the Maori, from pretty much every culture that I've studied. There are pieces of, piece of, this, pieces of this pie that, that play into this understanding of how things work. Um, okay, the idea that there is a, a non-material realm that we can't readily see is one that sounds pretty uh, questionable. And the idea that something that's non-material can become material is something that seems pretty questionable. But if you stop and consider that the quantum world, as we describe it scientifically, begins as waves, and simply detecting the wave, simply an act of, 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 how can I say, perception of that wave, suddenly the behavior of that wave turns particle-like. Instantaneously, it happens so quickly we can't even see it happen. And there's nothing we can do to stop it from happening. And what that, if you think about it, that perspective is flatly saying that something that we consider to be non-material, which is the wave, can present itself to us as something that is material, which is a particle. That's not um, wild science. That's fundamental science. Um, from the Dogen perspective, it's such an automatic thing. It's as, as intuitive and automatic as water turning into ice. It's the same kind of a process. It's compared to uh, a phase transition, which is what ice forming is. Well, what you're saying reminds me of the quote that's uh, often attributed to Buddha, but uh, apparently, you know, it could also be attributed to Tao Te Ching, um, which is when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And that, that's actually something that I think is probably true. Um, any When I have discussions with other people who are researching in these fields, um, it's like I'm talking to myself. There are odd things that happen from the time you start working with it. Um, I sort of, if I describe myself, I say, quote, unquote, out of the box. You know, as I came out of my packaging, out of the, the, the wrapped box, I was the, probably the least spiritually connected person I knew or I would have described myself as being. As soon as I started researching this stuff, all sorts of odd things happened. Um, some of them very tangible, some of them witnessed, some of them very subjective. And part of the process is, be, is learning how to distinguish between, same thing as the symbolism, being able to distinguish between um, a resemblance that you can anchor and one that you can't anchor. And a lot um, I'll give, give you an example of a tangible um, situation. Um, early when I was researching hidden meanings, I didn't know I was researching, and I was just following a trail of sources, I realized that the next source I needed to acquire was a book called Ancient Near Eastern Texts that Relate to the Old Testament. Um, and I, this was before you could go online and do book search, searches online. So I had exhausted all of the local bookstores, the new, the new bookstores, the used bookstores. Um, I had even gone so far as to go to Vass, the Vassar College Library to their interlibrary loan service and ask if they could get the book for me. And they couldn't. And so finally, after weeks of trying to locate one, I finally had to come back to my wife, Risa, and say, well, it looks like I'm not going to be able to get that book. 
A few days later, a box turned up at our back door. My wife had an aging cousin who lived in Queens, New York, who lived in a little apartment, and every so often it would sort of reach, reach critical mass in his apartment, and he would uh, decide to divest of things, and he would toss a bunch of random stuff, you know, flags of the nation, and, you know, hot mitts, and anything he, that he didn't need in his apartment, he would toss into a box, uh, address it to a relative, and mail it off. You know, didn't, not even checking with them first whether well, it was anything they even wanted. So, in the box was my book. And this cousin had no idea that I even had an interest in the subject. When we asked him about it, he couldn't even remember having owned the book. But in the box was my book. <laughs> it's, um, it's like if you will it, it will manifest. If you if you need it, it will show itself. Um, in the book Point of Origin, one of the things, one of the central images that things come down to is a high, highly secretive image in ancient times. It was so secretive that in 1100 A.D a Chinese emperor banned the image from being included in a master volume on Buddhism. It's, um, I could tell from the Dogen descriptions, there are relationships between um, the Dogen cosmology and the Buddhist cosmology that play out in relation to the elephant god Ganesha. Um, and Ganesha's symbolism in Point of Origin, there's a, a chapter that um, explains how Symbolism that relates to Ganesha that a Yale professor knew had to relate to progressive stages of creation fit the context that the Dogen describe. If you put it, if you under, if you look at it, interpret it in terms of the Dogen context, context, you suddenly understand what it represents. Well, I could tell from the Dogen system that there really should be two Ganeshas. There should be a male and a female Ganesha, and that. Um, you were talking about Gobekli Tepe, one, the probably the most immediate symbol that you think I think of when I think of Gobekli Tepe, is the the two carved arms that run down the sides of a pillar, uh, and the hands wrap around the end of the pillar at the end. Um, it took me a while to understand that what was trying to be represented there was the concept of an embrace. Just as a sleeping goddess waking up is a, a central metaphor to this tradition, so is the coming together of those energies is characterized as an embrace. So I knew that based on my understanding from the Dogen side, I, there should have been archaic images of hugging or embracing Ganeshas. And so I went on a search for it. And I searched the cultures that I had studied and could find some references to it, but couldn't find an image because it was a secret image. It was so secretive an image that in India it was only allowed to be housed in portable shrines that could be moved on a moment's notice. I finally came across a modern image of it in Japan. It had survived in Japan. Um, and once I knew what to refer to it as, then I my, uh, I was looking online to see if I could find uh, like a little statue of it, and my wife actually turned one up in India that she could buy for, she could order for not very much money, um, a metal statue of these hugging Ganeshas. And so we placed the order for it, and we were told it would be six to eight weeks for shipping. So we thought, well, we can wait that long for it to come. 48 hours later, it was on our back porch. <laughs> so it's another... Uh, in a series of examples of uh, the, the thing that, that you when, you, when you declare positively this is something that I need to be able to move on from here, um, suddenly the thing is available. Now with, with reference to uh, like Ganesh and, and having that embrace, and I was able to find one image while I'm searching of uh, a, Ganesh, a Ganesh statue hugging another, or either a person or um, uh, or another Ganesh. I, I can't see the uh, Ganesh uses Amazon Prime. No, oh, that, that's a possible. This, this is also a stock <laughs> a stock photo. So it's interesting that you do mention that because like the 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 imagery does exist as an actual statue out somewhere. Um, yeah, if uh, the one I have is a brass statue, and it's it's um, two equal sized uh, uh, figures. One wearing uh, what's essentially a, a Jewish kippah. It's a symbol of the sun. It represents the material universe. The other one's not wearing one, symbolizing the non-material. Um, and there are, I even came across specific descriptions of how these statues have to be built, how high they need to be, what materials they're made out of, what features the figures have to be wearing. This is a, a very pivotal image. 
And were you able to determine what the uh, use or uh, the use of the statue would be if it if it had those specifications? Well, it I'm in the original form of these traditions, they were non-iconic. They had iconic objects, but they didn't make carve, uh, graven images of things. They didn't try to represent a deity in a form. They, they not like the in Egypt where you would see a statue of a god, um, or in ancient Greece where you would see statues, hum, human um, shaped statues of gods. In the original tradition, there were no iconic images, and so the idea of creating a statue with hugging Ganeshas sort of goes against the original mindset of the tradition. Um, but ultimately it was there to represent the, from my point of view, the, the interface between these two universes. And the information about the existence of the second universe is one of those secretive pieces that wasn't just handed out. And with this type of imagery uh, being prevalent, and uh, again, I, I'm, I'm an advertising and branding and design, so I have uh, uh, at least an extensive uh, background in terms of design themes being carried over and, and how, uh, you know, they don't just, uh, they're not just uh, coincidental. If something's designed a certain way and there's a certain feature, it is for a very good reason, I've always, uh, I've always found. Uh, right. And the theme of that, uh, of that, that hand placement for, for the embrace, uh, and I know that there have been connections that have been made by individuals like uh, Robert Schock and, and Graham Hancock with regards to those same that same imagery being used in uh, the, the Moai statues on Easter Island. Right. Which, uh, it, again, I'm, I'm not sure if this is going to be in, in another in an upcoming book or not, but uh, the, uh, the, the dating of that, um, uh, of, of Easter Island and some of the Moai statues can be traced back uh, to you know pre uh, you know pre the younger Dryas period, so we're we're talking twelve thousand years with with that same imagery. So, is this something you've looked into or can can discuss at this point with with the work that you're doing? There's um, a problem in terms of uh, a couple of problems in terms of dating. Um, for a long time, I thought that the the farthest back you could really anchor an interpretation was once there was written language around 3000 BC because before that it becomes problematic to find a convincing way to be able to demonstrate that something has to mean what you say it means um, I got I started to get around that problem when I studied the Chinese culture which d only dates from about 3000 BC but there's a long gap in information because things didn't we we only have surviving texts from around 300 BC and so consequently in China the academics fight over every little nuance because there's no written text to be able to anchor what the thing meant um, in my book on China I had noticed that the farther back in time you go the more commonality of language you have uh, as a matter of fact, one of the things that demonstrated that to me was uh, John Anthony West and Robert Schock were go were planning a trip to go back to Tepe, and I was invited to, my wife and I were invited to a party at John's house the night before they left, and I wanted to have some intelligent thing to talk about their upcoming trip with them about, so I started considering the, uh, the carved animals that are on those pillars. Um, many of the animal shapes are shapes that are important in the cosmology I study, and so my my initial instinct was I was looking at cosmological shapes here. These represent cosmological concepts, but there were certain animals that I wasn't familiar with. They weren't familiar to me through the Dogen system, and so I started knowing that I had um, commonality of language as time goes back. I started exploring the names of those animals in the Egyptian hieroglyphic dictionary, even though they were these are are Turkish. Um, region figures, I thought I might be able to, uh, that there was enough commonality that I might be able to f get some insights from the Egyptian dictionary as to what these animals represented. What I discovered was that all of the animals represented on those pillars, the names in the Egyptian dictionary were homonyms for cosmological terms. In other words, they're pronounced like a cosmological term. So, from my perspective, what I was looking at was a kind of proto writing here where a hunter-gatherer who didn't know how to read or write, but knew the names of all the animals, would walk up to a pillar at an instructional site, see the name of an animal, speak its name, and associate that with whatever concept he was being instructed in that was 
related relating to the concepts of creation. So, um, based on that perspective, the arms that come down around the pillar there, um, also the the import of that wasn't intuitive to me. Um, whoever carved those arms was clearly very skilled in terms of stoneworking and skilled in their ability to represent things by carving them. We can see, you know, full, all full relief figures of animals carved there. Yeah, that, that's something that takes, uh, you know, years to be able to match. Like, not, not, we're not talking just even on a, on a cultural scale, but an actual mastery scale to be able to do that as a stone worker. That takes a long time to learn. Yes, but what, what I wasn't expecting was that that same person might not be skilled at conveying emotion through carving and conveying an emotional feeling through carving. And so it never occurred to me that those arms might represent the concept of an embrace until one day, uh, a few years back during the middle of the summer, I thought I was researching a half a dozen different questions relating to language for different friends. And I had been working on these for the preceding week or so, trying to come up with an interpretation for them of what a symbol meant or what a word meant or, or how it related to a certain topic. This particular morning, I came up with answers to all six questions, all resolved with words from a single column of a single page of the Egyptian Hieroglyphic Dictionary. The seventh word on that page was a word that... The phonetics mean two things. It means pillar and it means embrace. That was the question I was researching for myself, was what these arms represented. And from there, I began ex exploring Egyptian concepts of the, an embrace and realized absolutely this is fundamental to what's going on here, that that's the initial thing that happens as matter forms is this embrace of energy that happens between the two um, universes. And so what we're seeing there, even though it doesn't look like a warm hug, is supposed to represent a motherly hug. And if it, if it were me and, and that my... Says to, says to me something about the experience level that whoever ins instructed that, whoever carved that, had with human perceptions of emotion. Well, I, I can say this, Alex. Like, you know, if, if dealing with my wife... My hands are pretty much placed in the same position when she's, you know, hugging me. <laughs> so. so that that's a, a shape or that that configuration and is part of that elephant statue, but you see it all over everywhere. And absolutely, for me, it represents a con they're conveying a concept of an embrace. Now there are other symbols on those pillars that also tie to that same outlook. Um, it's a good thing there's, the ancients liked to cop a feel too, where we wouldn't be here. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this is at, at belt high, so it's not it's not particularly suggestive. It's a, it's you know it's um, waist waist high. We have a waist high hug happening. This is supposed to know, this is supposed to be a hub, <laughs> a hug between siblings. <laughs> we're, we're, we're a lighthearted show here. <laughs> but um, so anyway, uh, there are other symbols on the pillars that, that relate to that same thing. There's uh, this enigmatic shape of an H. It looks like an H that turns up from culture to culture that, that no one's quite sure what's being represented there. But actually, the explanation that I found for it survived in the Masonic tradition. I came up with an early 1900s article in a Masonic magazine called the New Age Magazine that described what that age rep H represents, and it's meant to represent the coming together of two universal energies, a masculine and a feminine energy that catalyze the formation of creation. It's a representation of, of uh, the circle in the center with two pillars. Right. And so it's absolutely out of the same mindset that the, the concept of the embrace of, of the arms represents. Um, part of what's going on at these sites is they... Whoever put the instructional system together wasn't seems to have been not quite sure what references we were going to connect with. You know, it's like um, if you were trying to to if you're, you're playing charades with somebody and you're not sure if they were going to get a sports reference or if they're going to get a movie reference or if they're going to get a a book reference or whatever, you might try expressing the concept half a dozen different ways until they finally get the one year. That's you're trying. To that, that's why I don't make Simpsons jokes that refer to anything before season 15 with anybody under the age of 30. 
because I just don't um, get it. I, I make uh, Simpsons jokes because n- not for that reason, but because Matt Groening was a class behind me in high school. Oh, <laughs> wow! That's <laughs> so a lot. Of, a lot of the characters and a lot of the references are my references. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, that's that is actually very cool. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's so like just and just just kind of like off like off center here. Like when when you're looking at at let's say like shows that are dealing with uh, you know just a, a wide array of material. Do you, do you see the same symbolism um, and you know messages that may be coming up in certain shows just because somebody may be picking up on a wavelength or may get it and they're trying to kind of incorporate that? I do see um, I do see movies and TV shows and themes that they represent as often leading the the way here. There's a movie out right now, now called Arrival that if they don't know what they're talking about, they have absolutely hit the nail on the head of some of the essential questions that will be dealt with in in my later book. Yeah, I, I I've been meaning to see that one. I know it's based off of a a, a book. And it's, it's dealing with like the, that arrival. That's the one uh, where a, a linguistics professor is leading a, a team of, uh, you know, like a team of people because aliens have showed up on Earth and they're, a, you know, they've got a certain language for written and a certain language for spoken, and she has like a certain time limit to get it to get it figured out. That's right. Okay. That's exactly right. And um, I've heard reviews of the the film where the reviewer. Um, the references um, did, were sort of skewed to the experience of the of the reviewer, and the reviewer didn't really like the movie that much. But um, for myself, my wife, for my son, for my daughter, the, this these are references that are absolutely essential, very very close to the mark um, of what I think is really going on. And a lot of the themes that they're dealing with is essentially the the, the symbolism of, of uh, you know using symbolism to be able to convey an abstract concept in, in as quick a, a fashion as possible. So you know, these these are things that that linguists and I, I've worked with linguists for for several years myself. Uh, advertising deals with a lot of symbolism, metaphor. So does Freemasonry. Uh, you know, people don't necessarily understand or consider where a lot of the words or uh, using the idea of a metaphor comes from. And I know that some people that I know of personally, uh, metaphors just go right over their head. But if you if, if you write it out on, on a piece of paper or you tell them about something and you explain it a certain way, they're going to get it. Right. So it is, is like, it, for this type of metaphor, like I know Egypt has used metaphors to describe like pretty much everything. A lot of their languages is supposed to be metaphorical. Um, with... Uh, if we're dealing with this type of cosmology and, and this type of um, uh, connection between creation, I, again, I'm not sure if there if this kind of touches on a question I asked before that may may relate to future work. But what is the relation between uh, teaching um, a culture how matters formed in very abstract terms that they may not be able to do anything with? Uh, potentially unless they have like you know genetic labs like we do and using that symbolism to uh, to you know effectively um, influence that culture to the point where an entire civilization is built up around it okay well there is rationale for it um, imagine that um, I had an extremely important message that I needed to get to somebody but I had to pass it through a child who really didn't understand any of the terms or the concepts that I was trying to explain. Now imagine that a piece of the message I had to send was something that the person who was going to receive the message might not also get. It might be over their heads. Okay, so I was saying that when I looked at the Dogen structure of matter, I could see that the pieces that I understood the atom and the protons, electrons, and neutrons, were correct. That was enough for me to establish credibility for the possibility that the rest of it might be right, even though I didn't know what the rest of it was supposed to be yet. Well, that that structure of matter is a, is a fairly long series of stages and shapes and concepts. It's enough to establish 
it's, it's enough to go beyond coincidence. It can't be coincidental that somebody knew that. If they knew that, they were speaking, and it's not being presented as theory. It's being presented as fact, as is, is no this, knowledge. Is this like in a Dogen clay tablet, or is it in their stories? No, the, or? the Dogen actually don't have written language. Now, okay, there's another another obstacle to be overcome here. From our perspective, looking at this, writing is an improvement over symbolism as a way of communicating things. In the archaic mindset, writing is absolutely a last resort. As a matter of fact, the cultures that did the best job of preserving this tradition, in my experience, are the ones who never developed a system of writing. That symbolism is actually, um, when it's handled right, when it's understood right, when it's in the uh, being uh, exercised by somebody who has the right skills, is a far stronger way of representing and maintaining information than written language is. There's something about writing something down that absolves the person from having to understand it. It's like sitting in class. If the teachers, the professor is giving a, a lecture on something that you don't completely grasp, you'll write down the notes that are going to remind you what to go look up after the class is over to try to sort it out. That's sort of the effect that written language has from my perspective, that the initiates who who had to resort to writing it down were the ones who didn't keep it straight. And that would be very similar to how uh, apparently either writing on electrical, like electronic form. So if I'm typing something on my computer, because I'm, I could be looking at the words on a screen, uh, even though that screen is not an actual physical object, it's, it's a, just a, like a bunch of photons creating an image on a flat surface. But right. because I'm not actually creating the words with a pen on a piece of paper, I'm just simply typing out, you know, pressing buttons right. based on um, based on habit. And, you, you don't. And they've they've shown that, that you learn differently yes. between those two. Okay, so like that. That's okay. Now, now, so back to our, our rationale here. So, someone describes a structure of matter. Okay, for the first thing that tells you, they're describing the structure of matter to a group of people who have no use for it, and they've impressed on this group of people how very important it is that they keep this structure straight. Okay, so the first thing that it tells you is that whoever was giving the information had to have been very capable to understand that stuff. As a matter of fact, the whole question of, of aliens is a moot question because whoever presented the structure of matter easily knew as much as we do, and we're on the verge of being able to go off planet ourselves right now. So even if it was a high culture of our own from a long time ago that did this, we can say that they were on, at least on the verge of being space capable themselves. So the question of, of whether it was an alien or not is, is ridiculous. If we can go to another planet, somebody else can come here. It's a boot question. So having laid out the structure of matter, what that does for, oh, we, we can tell that, that that information was aimed at an audience that was a future technologically capable audience that it was intended that it was going to come to somebody like us because a lot of the symbols, there's a, a lot of the symbols are such that you would not recognize them if you didn't have the technology. There's a class of Buddhist symbols called adequate symbols that can't lose, inherently can't lose their meaning. They rest on things like the shape of an electron orbit, where anybody who sees the shape is, who is technologically knowledgeable is going to understand what that is and what it represents. It's inherently the right thing. Um, so... We know that it's intended for a future audience, but uh, that future audience might well not be as technologically capable as the people who put the system together in the first place. So they, like me, they may get the references to the atoms and electrons, but not get the rest of it. That's a situation that I had. I got down to waves, and that's as far as I knew how to interpret. There was nothing beyond that that I could interpret. Now, the inherent difficulty there is how you convince the person that what you're telling them about this fundamental set of processes that they have no way of verifying, how do you convince them that they're telling you the truth? The way you convince them is you establish credibility first, and you establish that credibility by correctly reciting the alphabet of matter first. You recite it from A to Z as far as they're concerned. Now we're going to tell you about the letters that come before A. Anybody who understands they correctly recited A to Z is going to 
automatically be oriented in a way to give the benefit of the doubt to the letters that come before A. And so that's one of the motivations, that's a problem, one of the key motivations of having laid out this system in the way that it was laid out for a culture that had no use for it to carry forward in the future. It was needed to establish credibility for the real message, which is the stuff that goes beyond what we can verify. And a lot of that was based off of potentially what we could be uh, dealing with as far as as far as the civilization or planet, you know, in in uh, you know in the coming years or centuries. So it's it's like if this uh, paired uh, paired universe or paired existence uh, is not necessarily physical, maybe it's possible that they don't uh, necessarily perceive time the same way that they do or that we do. Uh, maybe time isn't necessarily a concept, so they're they're kind of like playing the long game, as it were. That's true, and time is absolutely enters into this. Um, if you understand that Einstein says that as a thing becomes more massive, time frame slows. Now, follow that continuum downward, and you realize that something like a, a virtually massless wave has got to exist in an ultra-fast time frame compared to ours. Now, that makes sense when you think that when we perceive a wave, instantaneously it's trans. Uh, we see the particle appear in front of us. It's sort of like you know the the steps uh, laying out in the air in the, ahead of Magneto uh, as he walks across them. Matter is being continuously created faster than we can perceive it being created. It's like um, if you have slow response time on your computer, you might see an image form in three se three or four segments instead of just all at once. Well, matter is forming all at once, and the way it's able to do that is because it's happening at an ultra-fast time frame compared to us. And once you understand that, all of the quantum weirdness goes away, because an act of perception is essentially just imparting, what it's actually doing is it's accelerating the wave, and when it accelerates the wave, it's imparting mass to the wave, and that sets off a chain reaction that imparts more and more and more and more mass to the wave. And as it's becoming more massive, it's slowing it down so that it now falls in the range of our perception. All, And the original event is happening so quickly that we don't have a tool refined enough to measure it. It's like trying to measure centimeters with a yardstick. And because we don't have a tool that's refined enough, all the results look random to us when they aren't. So it's it's like the uh, the equivalent of uh, because we can't measure it, uh, the cat's dead as well as alive at the exact same time. <laughs> yes, I, I, that analogy I don't you know I, I I have some issues with it. It's I don't really buy the analogy in the first place that the cat is both alive and dead. From our perspective, it might be alive or it might be dead. Schrodinger's but, still gone. But, but I don't really believe that it's both. I think Schrodinger smoked some really good weed, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm more on the side of Einstein's initial reaction was it can't be random. And the reason it can't be random is because we're looking at a process that is a continuum. There's no point along that continuum where there's opportunity to introduce randomness to it. It's like everything kind of has a plan or it's set out in motion uh, towards a certain end or a certain formula, and we're just kind of riding the wave to, you well, know, to, to that formula's resolution. No, there may be more than one possibility involved. It's like one of the comparisons I make is if you were standing at the top of the Empire State Building filming the traffic below you going by, um, and after you got the video back to your computer, you sped, sped it up. It would reach a point where it no longer looked like individual cars. It would look like waves of light, or it would look like beams of light. It's like those nice landscape photos of, of like Los Angeles uh, on the freeway. Right, that's right. At okay. night, with the lights on the on the freeway. So it looks like waves to us, but what we're seeing is a difference in time frame. This is also why it looks like the rate at which the universe has been expanding has been increasing. That's not what's happening. What's happening is our universe has been be becoming more massive. And as our universe becomes more massive, time frame changes. And we're looking at things that didn't happen at the same time scale that we're used to. And we're misinterpreting them. And that's going to send, because even when it comes to dark energy and, and dark matter, how that's sourced from, everything they have is just based a theory on that. So there's still... Uh, you know, there's still some uh, studies that say, like, no, dark matter is creating dark energy and ex further expansion of the universe. But at the same time, you've got people saying, no, no, this isn't the case. It's not expanding. It's just, uh, you know, kind of a, a, a mis misconception, as it were. Um, now, 
if we're dealing with you know cosmologically very small time scales from from uh, let's say Gobekli Tepe at twelve thousand years ago compared to now, and uh, the uh, you know the, the the start of this entire process and uh, taking into account the possibility that. Uh, the the teachers whomever whether they're beings or not or or where the source of information is coming from if they can see you know the forest for the trees as it were and we can only kind of see a pine cone that's kind of sitting on the ground um i i, I kind of think to what could you know what what this what could the reason be and i i harken back to a, a work by randall carlson and a lot of the um his study into the the symbology of um you know anything pre-diluvian with regards to uh, a cycle of catastrophes uh, such as let's say when it comes to earth meteor impacts um, and that would lead into let's say the the uh, uh, you know the younger dryas impact uh, event which you know brought us from us going out of the ice age to going into another ice age uh, for 1200 years and uh, having all of this symbolism that is uh, encoded into uh, the you know mystery schools like in uh, like Freemasonry. A lot of what we deal with, even though it uh, deals with um, uh, a, a lot of math uh, uh, mathematical and geometric terms, a lot of it is to preserve antediluvian knowledge uh, because there was a meteor impact, and a lot of the symbolism is to to show that this meteor impact actually happened, and to forewarn us that a meteor impact might be coming potentially. Uh, that. From my perspective, even though it's a, a reasonable rationale for why this might be happening, from my perspective, there's a far more compelling rationale for why the esoteric tradition happened the way that it did and the timing of when it happened, uh, the eras of it over a period of time. And what it boils down to, the essence of it is, is that there is a, a vital mutual interest that we share with the non-material universe. And something vital to the non-material universe depends on us doing certain things at a certain time. But it's not just us doing things for them. It's a mutual imperative. It's a mutual thing that's going on. And that, um, that that's really as far as, that, as I can go is that when you get down to the bottom of it, there's an absolutely compelling, heart-wrenching reason why... This had to happen the way that it did, and why structures of our society were trying to be set up in the way that they were. And it doesn't have to do with warning about a forecoming disaster, it really, not really, and it doesn't have to do with um, educating us, or trying to preserve the knowledge of something that happened, happened in the past so much. It's, okay, in the, in, in the archaic traditions, the way they express it, there are two goals. One goal is to help humanity understand its true relationship to the larger processes of creation. Because if we were to understand what our true relationship was to those processes, the choices that we would make regarding it would be different. The second purpose is to help us develop what is described as discriminating knowledge. In other words, to have enough of an overview, enough of a, of a sense of what has to be true to be able to make discriminating choices when we don't know what's true. And those are the two flatly stated purposes of, of this whole thing. Um, it, it's really an interesting system. Uh, it, uh, Jung was trying to find out, you know, was exploring how it, how is it that all the different cultures have, seem to have the same symbols and the same mythic themes and the, um, so much overlap from culture to culture. Cultures that were far distant from each other and as far as we know didn't have any contact with each other, how come they all have the same references? Um, Narrower roots of population? <laughs> going, <laughs> yeah. going backwards in the past? Maybe. Uh, there were attempts, a lot of different academic attempts were made during the 1800s to pick one culture as a source culture and try to trace forward from it to all the other ones. And every one of those attempts ended up failing because of some contradiction that they bumped up against. As you go um, further and further back in time, there's less to plagiarize off of other cultures. <laughs> <laughs> so from my perspective, a different thing is going on here. It, it, 
I compare it to if you and I had the same math teacher at different eras of the math teacher's career, and we meet at a cocktail party and um, realize that we have all the same references. We know all the same little tricks for figuring out a formula and all, all the same little um, story problems and you know, all the same uh, perspectives on things. Not because you or I ever knew each other, but because we had the same teacher. Well, that's essentially what I see going on with these cultures is the reason they all have the same stuff is because they were all influenced by the same teacher. Now, some people will say, well, this is just parallel development, that any two cultures that build structures out of stone, it's only a matter of time before they think to stack them up like a pyramid. And I say that's true. It is a matter of time before they do that. But there's all sorts of complicated symbolism that goes with that form that both cultures have and that wouldn't automatically accrue from the choice to stack the stones up. And so it's, it's finding these considerations that point to what has to be true in situations where we're not, it's not clear what's true. That's sort of what the focus of my books was on. And so essentially the idea is that it's, you know, it, it could be a possibility that a lot of the symbolism is uh, inherited or taught or kind of passed down along the ages, but at the same time, it's like, okay, uh, Gobekli Tepe, like for instance, Gobekli Tepe happened after, uh, you know, let's say, you know, actually, I think it actually happened, uh, Gobekli Tepe, excuse me, Gobekli Tepe came about before the Younger Dryas impact. And well, that's where the, the, the Gobekli Tepe is uh, around ten thousand, about twelve thousand years ago. So, so I, I place it after the, just after the end of the Ice Age. Okay, it, well, it, it was it being around that time, and I know that Gobekli Tepe was um, uh, was intentionally buried. So at some point in time, something kind of happened to stop whatever work was being done there, or teaching was done there, or maybe it was just done. And then between then and at another point in time, let's say the message was kind of lost. So they came back and said, okay, well, you know, we got to kind of reteach things along and, and kind of uh, get a refresher course. It's, it's like if you're a programmer and you haven't, you know, if you're used to dealing with COBOL and all of a sudden you transition into C++ and you're doing that for, you know, 10, 15 years and all of a sudden you're throwing a, a, pro, a COBOL project, you're going to have to go back to that, uh, to, you know, to your reference material and and relearn all the syntax and and uh, and operations. Right. So, so that is, um, is that the, a good way of interpreting a potential it, of, of what happened? It is um, uh, that okay in the Old Testament when the jealous God says, "Thou shalt have no other gods before me." The Hebrew scholars interpret that to say the statement implies there were other gods. Well, in a similar way, when the Egyptians talk about the first time, their famous first time, capital F, capital T, and the Buddhists talk about the first time that knowledge was imparted to humanity from a Buddha, the use of that phrase first time implies that there was more than one time. Now, from my perspective, if you... Um, if you uh, entertain Robert Boval's idea that the three large pyramids of Giza represent the belt stars of Orion at 10,000 BC, and the idea that the Sphinx pointed to the constellation of Leo in that same era of 10,000 BC, then from the perspective of a researcher like me, there are only two possibilities. Either the alignments were placed there at 10,000 BC, or else some later culture somehow had the ability to retrospectively calculate what the alignment should have been. I find the second possibility not very credible. And so that says to me, we had 10,000 era, 10,000 BC era influences on Egypt that probably relate to Gobekli Tepe. Um, I trace those forward through a group called the Shakti cult. This is an archaic matriarchal cult that uh, originated to the north and west of India, which in the general direction of, of the Fertile Crescent and Gobekli Tepe, um, that goes so far back, they can't even trace how far back it goes. But all of the symbolic elements that the Shakti cult preserves are the same ones that we see at Gobekli Tepe. One of the really telling ones comes out of a, a common translation of the words Gobekli Tepe. It was a lot of people, when they ask, what does Gobekli Tepe mean? They say, well, it means... Potbelly Hill. 
and they don't go farther than that. For the Shakti cult, one of their iconic objects was a clay pot filled with water to represent a womb that was called a pot belly. And so we have that kind of linkage back to go back to the Tepe, where each of the iconic practices and aspects of the Shakti cult we see playing out at Gobekli Tepe. It looks like they tie it together. And th this is very similar to the to, to the uh, mother goddess or corpulent goddess uh, imagery, which has been found all over Europe and Asia and Africa, which can date back, you know, 10, 20,000 years. And that's that's the, the same concept of the sleeping goddess. It's the, basically the same image. Um, this is a, a system that goes goes back quite a ways. Um, if you think about the, if you know anything about the yuga cycle in in Buddhism, I do. Uh, the concept that uh, humanity goes through a cycle of perception, where during certain periods of time we're more able to perceive things that are non-material or spiritual, and at other periods we're less able. We've just passed the period where we're least able to perceive things that are non-material, according to the yuga cycle. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, that would be the uh, uh, the Kali phase. Yeah, that we're just okay. we're really coming out of the Kali phase and into uh, the Dwapara phase. Um, now, there's one other piece of this I wanted to talk about about how we can confirm meaning between these cultures. Um, it's understood that the cosmology preceded written language. That's an accepted that's accepted by traditional researchers. Now. I could tell looking at uh, a lot of the, the Dogen priests say that they are incapable of discussing a concept without drawing it at the same time. I, I find a similar um, effect happening for me that if I'm trying to explain something to somebody, it's my, I, much easier to do if I can draw it for them at the same time I talk about it. But um, there are a set of maybe 30 Dogen cosmological drawings that take the same shape and have the same meanings as certain Egyptian glyphs. And so I started exploring, not knowing anything about Egyptian hieroglyphic language, I started exploring words that use those glyphs to see if I could find relationships. And I did find relationships. Um, the easiest example comes out of an Egyptian word that means week, like a seven-day week for us. Um, it's a very straightforward Egyptian word. It's only written with two glyphs. It's a circle with a dot in the middle of it, which is the sun glyph, and one of the the symbolic meanings of that is it represents the concept of a day. The other glyph is an upside down U that is the Egyptian number 10. And so I looked at that word for week and I said, symbolically, this looks to me like it says 10 days. And I went and I did some research and discovered something I didn't know before. The Egy ancient Egyptians had a 10 day week. And I thought, wow, that's really interesting. The word told me its own meanings with the symbols it was written with. What are the chances that any other Egyptian words do that? Turns out they all do. That every Egyptian word, from my perspective, creates a symbolic sentence, sort of like a, a rebus puzzle, a child's puzzle, where you see a picture of an eye and you say eye. <laughs> That's the way that I see these Egyptian glyphs working, that if you substitute concepts for symbols, you produce a symbolic sentence. Uh -huh. And that sentence tells you what the word means. Was there any really good um, hieroglyphic interpretation sources that you found, like the Rosetta Stone of hieroglyphics or something that you would recommend for Actually, the general the, public? The, for, for my and I have been predictably able to tie all of the key Dogen words that this cosmology based on, or most of them, to Egyptian words in Budge's dictionary. Now, as far as the modern Egyptologists are concerned, Budge was so had such a poor understanding of the language that some of them say he couldn't even read Egyptian hieroglyphs. I say that I know that Budge can't possibly be wrong about his dictionary in a way that predictably agrees with the Dogen, just like um, the Dogen cosmology couldn't be a, a, a falsification and still predictably agree with Buddhism. It's the same concept. And so I've got a body of significant words here related in a system, a cosmological system, that I can all tie out to Budge's dictionary. It's clear to me that at least in terms of cosmo cosmological words, Budge knew exactly what he was talking about. 
And so I use a dictionary that the traditional Egyptologists don't like. But I justify it because I have a whole new body of evidence here you haven't considered. You know, you can't tell me that Budge doesn't know what he's talking about if you haven't looked at these words. Um, so now there's also a class of Egyptian word where the final glyph of the word isn't pronounced. And the Egyptologists say that the glyph is there for emphasis. Usually the glyph has something to do with the meaning of the word. Like if the word is a word for table, maybe it's a picture of a table at the end of the word that doesn't get pronounced. It's there for emphasis. I say, no, that's not true. From my perspective, the reason that trailing glyph is there is because the symbolic sentence defines a meaning for that glyph. In other words, the Egyptian hieroglyphic language told us what the symbolism of their own glyphs was. They defined it for us. And once I figured that out, then I could lay out hundreds, literally hundreds of Egyptian glyphs and what their symbolism was based on what the spellings of the words that ended in those glyphs were. It might be a hop, skip, and a jump, but do you have any correlation between like ancient Sumeria or um, like cuneiform writing styles or anything like that uh, that relates to Dogen culture? Uh, not the, okay, in, in Sumerian language, their, their language is originally symbolic also before cuneiform, but the positive link is really to Chinese hieroglyphs. Now, the Chinese hieroglyphs are read the way that I'd read Egyptian glyphs, but the change in Chinese had a word for week, and their word for week was written with two glyphs, their sun glyph, which was, which was originally a circle with a dot, and their number 10, and they had a 10-day week. So comparing a single word, the way it's formulated symbolically and the way it conveys its meaning symbolically, I can positively correlate, positively assert that the Egyptian and the ancient Chinese hieroglyphic languages came out of the same mindset. That was actually something I've been considering or at least thinking about for some for some time. I, even today, I'm like, do I get to ask that question? And you kind of just, <laughs> you just, you just laid it out for me. Uh, with the Creech, or at least the the, uh, the the kanji style of writing, and I believe that's the, the calligraphic, calligraphic style of writing that you're referring to. Um, if you have a difference in the way that they're shaped in Chinese, a lot of the times or sometimes versus uh, you know Egyptian hieroglyphs, um, are you talking the basic symbols are ba are you know are, are very similar, if not the same, with a few differences? If you look at it differently, or has it been a um, you know, are, is it using different slashes and forms uh, to essentially convey the same message, but just using different angles? There's a, a base set of glyphs that are formulated the same way. And actually, I didn't understand why certain Egyptian glyphs were formulated the way they were, configured the way they were, until I studied the Chinese cosmology. And the chi China provided me with the rationale that had been lost in Egypt for why that glyph took that shape. Um, so there's a lot of back and forth that happens. But the key principle here is I had talked about multiple meanings of words. Um, that's not really the precise case. It's not that half a dozen different meanings go along with a particular phonetic value for the Dogen. It's that half a, di half a dozen different concepts are grouped together. They're sort of um, a cluster of meanings that belong together cosmologically. Um, There's an aesthetic layer and like a mimetic layer to those symbols. Yeah, they, they relate to each other outside of the context of a glyph and outside of the context of a phonetic value. These, these meanings belong together. Now in ancient China, you find myths of, about certain um, emperors who are quasi-historical. And the myths tell us what the name of the emperor was and where he was born and certain key things he's remembered for doing and why he was honored or dishonored or whatever, certain key facts about uh, in the storyline of this emperor. Well, when you look at those, the, the key words that define those attributes in the Egyptian hieroglyphic dictionary, they're all homonyms of a, of a cosmological term. In other words, it looks to me as if this story was written to encode those meanings. It's as if um, life wasn't as stable in China as it had been in Egypt. And so rather than trying to pass this forward as an esoteric tradition from priest to initiate, they had to try to pass it forward disguised in the form of a story. 
that would be something very similar to how the uh, the troubadours in in uh, Europe uh, essentially passed along certain cosmological um, uh, you know symbolism or stories based around let's say like the the Holy Grail mythos. Now I've got another problem with that perspective that is much thornier. Um, after I wrote the first book, I was invited to a meeting in New York City with um, someone who said they were a friend of John Anthony West. He wanted to meet me at a cafe. And so I agreed to meet him. And um, at the last minute, he asked if he could bring a friend along. And I said, sure. Turns out the meeting wasn't with him. It was with his quote unquote friend. And, it, and she wasn't his friend. She was his um, spiritual um, guide, his spiritual mentor. Now, the entire meeting consisted of her asking me questions about my own history and my own life. Like she would say, the first question was, describe your marriage to me. I said, well, I've always seen my wife's and my marriage as the large overlap of two circles. And she said, that's a shape, that's, that's a shape called a vesica Pisces. Do you understand that that shape is important it's, it's a central sh symbol in the traditions you study. And I said, yes, I, I understood that. Well, this whole hour and a half meeting was a series of these questions where she would ask a question, I would give an answer, and then she would explain to me how my answer demonstrates that something pivotal to the things I'm studying relates to me. And so um, the... The last question she asked was, who did I think was responsible for the system of symbols that I was researching? And I told her that I didn't know who was responsible for it, but that I knew enough to understand that what would eventually tell me who. And she said, did you just say what will tell me who? And I said, yes. And she said, we're done. And she got up and she left. So I came back to Albany, um, about a three-hour train trip up the river from New York City, and found an email waiting for me from a person I'd never met who was an acquaintance by, by email who lived in Australia, who said, and she also claimed to be psychic, but she said that all of her psychic friends were in a dither, they were in a tizzy, because they knew about the meeting that had happened in New York, and they were upset because I had been granted permission to research things they wanted to research. So another one of the odd things that happens. But as time has gone on, the, the books that I'm playing out, the concepts that I'm researching, keep expressing themselves with words that are familiar things to me. There are names of places I lived, or names of people I knew, or teachers I had, or nicknames of my um, great nephew, that kind of thing. Until finally we come around to the mystery of Scarabray. Scarabray site in 1850 was covered over, had been covered over for 4,000 years, and a series of storms hit the island and un uncovered a piece of it so that the gentleman who owned the land that the the site was on, realized that it was an important site and needed to be excavated. The guy was the Laird of Scale. So now the Scarabray book brings me around to my actual name, <laughs> my actual first name. So the problem I have in terms of the, the myths of these emperors is that if 200 years from now somebody were looking back at me and the books that I've written, and the key elements that make up those books and compared them to the key events and people that had passed by in my lifetime, I would look mythical to them. These are all words that pertain to me in the story of my life. These are not, this is not cosmo. I mean, this is not history. This is cosmology. <clears throat> you know, so, so above <laughs> as below. It's, it's like it was, it was meant to be, uh, I wouldn't go so far as that, but I, but I would go so far as to say that there may be a fundamental inability to distinguish what's historical from what's mythical. Well, that's one of the biggest issues that at least some uh, researchers of ancient ancient history will have with regards to mythology. And some will say, okay, well, there is uh, some mythology that is, uh, you know, like, you know, you have to at least consider what the mythology says as potential fact, uh, or some people will say, no, it's just metaphorical. Um you know, a thousand years from from now, it, it's kind of hard to be able to say what's uh, going to be considered 
real or not. You know, there's a possibility that someone's going to... Uh, you mean we didn't steal fire from the gods? <laughs> well, I, I was I was going to think more along the lines of like what happens when somebody picks up a, a Super Mario Brothers uh, you know game guide and then they they hear about uh, the Mario and the Luigi who saved the princess and then they create this entire you know uh, mythology around it. It's Let's a, hope that or or they think it's an actual real historical and they're like no back then they were actually in two dimensions and very short and very fat. That's just the way yeah, things work. Alex, the way that I heard it was that Putin hacked fire from the gods. <laughs> I like that one. That's good. Um, uh, so um, now another thing that the, the upcoming book that talks about fundamental processes of creation also provides an explanation for why everything that that this duality of things looking both mythical and historical. That's another one of the pieces that there is at least an arguable rationale for why it's that way. And this is also making it very interesting because we're getting a lot of, you know, slight previews and, and you know, things for our listeners to be able to wet their lips over over the next two years. And well, the, the trick is to, for me to, to be able to avoid talking about it. The Scarab Ray book, I, I broke with tradition and actually talked about almost a year before the book was published, which is not a good choice from a publishing standpoint because the publisher, you know, wants doesn't want me to talk about something until, I, until they have something that's ready to go, a product that's ready to go. Just doing your own teasers. <laughs> well, you know, th there was there was one video of you from July of this year uh, that you had given a presentation based on your research for for Scar Bray, and uh, that was the uh, kind of the one thing that really got me hyped for the book, or, you know, because I'd, like I'd heard about it, and I was waiting for it. So for that like four months, I was counting down. So. It, you know, I can understand from a publisher standpoint, they want to make sure things are exclusive and there's no spoilers or what have you. But, you know, like that, that type of presentation, like people are going to want that type of knowledge. And if, if you have your followers and they're, they're going to ravenously eat up anything that you release because it's awesome. Well, thanks. Well, also the argument of that upcoming book is complicated enough that I felt that I needed to work up PowerPoint slides myself just to keep myself on track in terms of walking somebody through how the foundation plays out because it's a very set, subtle set of connections that have to be understood in the right order to be able to get to an answer that makes really good sense. Now, uh, PowerPoint presentations, well, you know, when that book comes out, we actually do shows with PowerPoint presentations. So <laughs> that's interesting. If, if that's something you want to be able to, to, to do, you know, uh, I'll more, be more than willing to help you promote the book because, you know, th this type of information has to be shared and, and it has to get out there at least, f you know, at minimum. So people to at least see another perspective and start thinking. And that that's also one of my starting points. My base principle is that this knowledge can't be proprietary this that that anytime you're making a choice that argues that it, it what the, the choice is being made on the basis of it having to be proprietary is the wrong choice the profound and, and proprietary don't go well together and that's that's partly why I went against my own rule to talk about Scarab Ray book ahead of time is because um, the only reason for not making it was to keep the information proprietary. And with the the information, like how how was the at least I, I know I love the book. I know anyone I've talked to has loved it. Uh, what 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 have um, like for for your friends and family when when you said you were going to write this one, it, like when they read it from when you had first started working on it, like what was their perception? Like did did it? Uh, expand their mind even more afterwards even though you're talking, you're talking about the the upcoming book oh no i'm, I'm talking about the the, the least the scare, well, either or the scare, okay um well let's see part of the problem is that my family um sort of sees this stuff evolve as it goes i have a very good friend who, who passed away last year who was um she was a, a well-known author herself but she said the reason that she liked my books is because i take the reader on the journey with me well, my family has already been on the journey as I was going through it. I mean, as I'm discovering stuff, it's the, man, you're not going to believe this and try to explain the best I can to my adult children and my wife what what perspective I just gained on something. So they, they sort of saw it as they went. And so um, seeing it in written form is sometimes a, almost anticlimactic for them. They, they Yeah, tell me something I don't know here, you know. The coattails of a researcher. <laughs> the but, final uh, book. 
<laughs> yes. It's um, all, all really uh, interesting stuff. One of the things I would really love to be able to do in the future is I'm, I'm starting to know enough to be able to rewrite some of the original myths. The problem is that the way that meaning is conveyed in those myth, it, myths is very dependent on the language that they were written in because words that were they depend on certain words being homonyms for other words that aren't homonyms in English. And so it would be a real challenge to try to produce these myths in a way that accomplished what the original myth did. It, it's like with, um, I forget the language, or even most languages, uh, English is can be so direct, but it can be so very bad at being able to convey certain messages, where a word in German, for instance, will have... You know, like that same word, the translation for the term would be, you know, a sentence long in English, essentially. Yes. So, have you ever seen the, uh, the there's a YouTube station called Hot for Words with the lady, she talks about words and seductive clothing. We just need a hot for hieroglyphics. <laughs> she's, she's hot, hot for words? We need a hot for hieroglyphics uh, YouTube channel. Well, well one, one interesting thing Laird had mentioned before, well, like we were talking on, on, uh, on uh, Skype briefly while we're waiting for you to get back from a meeting. And uh, he'd mentioned that uh, uh, that you, you were starting to research swear words in, in <laughs> Egy ancient, ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. Please. Yeah, I was joking, joking that I was going to try to learn how to swear in Egyptian hieroglyphics. Um, you know, the, the best I can get from the African side is dog on it. <laughs> but -oomch. that's a good one. <laughs> now we have ancient dad jokes. Oh jeez. <laughs> but there's a lot here to like um a lot of stuff going on that that is uh, very interesting. Um there are different ways you were talking about ways of um receiving information and could it be done through drugs and the different different methods that people have of of acquiring information. Well, there's actually a section in one of the Kabbalist books I was researching uh, where they talk about, they, they give definitions for various categories of, of spiritually connected people. And I was interested to read these because you know, I've been asked by people, well, so what happens to you here? Do you, do you like go into a, um, a faint to get this stuff or how, what happens? Do you talk in tongues? You know, how does this go? And I, I say, no, that, it doesn't happen at all. What happens is that the thing that I need is available to me when I need it. Well, it turns out that's a thing. That's a class of, of um, clairvoyant that the Kabbalists refer to as a pure mystic. It's uh, specifically defined as the kind of person who, without anything unusual happening in their life, as they need the information specifically about cosmology, it's available. I was actually writing a, a blog post, and I, I do some content writing. That is actually one of the core concepts, or at least one of the positions that people want to, or that they want to get at least people to convey in terms of like feeling that you are enough as an individual. And that idea of, you know, you're, you're always going to need what you, when you need, you're always going to need, uh, I should you'll say. You'll have what you need. You'll when have you what need you need it. when you need it. It's all, it will always right. be there. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, part, part of that rests on trusting that you'll always have what you need when you need it. And that's a tough, tough place to get somebody to. Um, part of what my adult son and I were trying to accomplish when we went to the UK this summer and visited Scarabray and some sites that are connected to that that I think are really foundationally pivotal to this whole system was to try to restore a connection that he had always had since childhood that he had had since sort of become broken for him. And, and it worked. It, uh, he came back um, much, much prepared from what he had been before we left. Hmm. But you, ha you have to trust. So he used to always say, the universe has got my back. And uh, now it's back to a point where it really feels like it does. That that's actually something I, I I can understand. Like having ha having had a roller coaster of a life in in my uh, in my twenties, my my tumultuous twenties, as I like to to say, and use as many syllables as possible to do it. Uh, you're you know, so loquacious. Yeah, oh, well, <laughs> you're you're the wordy one. That's why I have you on here, Alex. Okay. Yeah. That that and your flowing flowing long locks of hair. That that too, which nobody can see. I'm yeah. pretty sure when he said loquacious, he meant you were good looking. 
D- deliberately wordy. Yes. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Literally misunderstanding. Like, <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I, I was going to ask if there's anything in the Dogen uh, culture that has to do with uh, metallurgy or metals or anything like that. that yes, uh, in ab- the origin absolutely. stories. Yep, absolutely. Um, as a matter of fact, it comes back to your myth of sealing fire. That it was the Dogen um, smithy um, who needed fire for his um, his metallurgy, who ended up stealing fire from from um, the the Dogen don't really have deities where other cultures do. They have um, quasi mythic ancestors, and uh, the smithy stole fire from these ancestors, and in the process of the myth, ran around the um, his granary, the um, smithy, the the forge was sitting in the square flat roof area of the of this stupa like shrine, and there's uh, staircases up each of the four sides of the of the structure, and he ended up not being able to find a staircase and ran around the the granary a number of times before he finally was able to take the fire up to where the the um, forge was supposed to be. And uh, the myth itself is sort of a metaphor for the way that electrons work. That's one of the levels that can be understood on. Um, but um, yes, absolutely, there's metallurgy um, that everything connected to the Dogen culture and their civilizing plan is tagged to what would be needed for a successful agriculture. Um, one of those things is the ability to make um, like metal hose and and si- uh, size and things like that, tools for agriculture. Um, Which goes kind of to the interesting point where, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, gods who came or quote unquote gods who came to uh, teach the people after whether it was, you know, uh, you know, after creation or after a catastrophe where it's okay, you're, you're going to learn fishing, you're going to learn agriculture, you're going to learn uh, animal husbandry, then we're going to work on the stone working and all these other things. And finally, it's, you know, this, this imagery of you know, like with, with the Greeks and the Elysian fields. And, uh, you know, I think, I think the, uh, the, the Dogon also have a similar imagery with that, with regards to where the spirit could pass to. And a lot of the times that's supposed to be a, a physical, like also a physical representation in either a country or within the village. Is that, is that not correct? Right. Uh, the, um, as I was examining the series of megalithic sites on Orkney Island and thinking about them and the progression that they represent cosmologically, I realized that for the Dogen, the progression continues upward from this cluster of, of houses. Um, that the next stage scientifically speaking, is the stage at which um, particles emerge from what the scientists call the background field. And the way the Dogen represent that is every year before they plant their crops, they go to the field of their highest priest, who's called the arrow priest, and they create a field drawing that um, is almost akin to a, a crop circle. It's a circle with zig- filled with zigzag lines that represent vibrations of matter. So realizing that the Dogen were Egyptian at the time that Scarabray was founded, I thought the Egyptians must have a similar concept. And I went to look for it and realized the Egyptian word for field is seket. And there is a concept, seket eru, in Egypt. But it's a term that refers to the field of reeds, which is a place that people, basically a representation of heaven, a place where spirits go when they die. But for the Dogen and for the Egyptians and for the later uh, Greek concept of the Elysian fields, this is a concept that's handled on two levels. It's, it's a cosmological concept or a mythical concept, but it also represents a real world field that's actually planted and cultivated and um, the, the crops are picked and so forth. So um, it makes sense that Orkney Island could be the geographic locale for the Egyptian concept. When the uh, Greeks describe it, um, their writers uh, d- give um, geographical descriptions that are all a fit for Orkney Island, where it's located physically, what its climate's like, um, also, even down to a term Okeanos that they refer to it by. The Egyptians, when they draw paintings of it, picture animals there that are actually indigenous to Orkney Island. So there are lots of reasons to think that there could be a connection. That is wild. If, if you're thinking about 
and so, someone's going to make a, uh, you know, like an afterlife joke, if, if especially in the wintertime. And, you know, northern uh, the northern seas can get quite cold. And some, some people may <laughs> see that as kind of a hell. So <laughs> well, back in the day, if, they, if the agriculture was happening there, um, it was uh, we can imagine the climate might have been warmer there than actually just before 3200 B.C., the climate did warm there. People will sometimes ask me if I believe in an afterlife, and I, my, uh, the answer I give them is uh, that my wife and I barely believe in a nightlife. <laughs> so we're still dealing with the, the nightlife. We haven't now, gotten to afterlife yet. Now I know this is something you, you've uh, that you've talked about it'll, extensively. It'll be there when you need it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, that's a good one. Uh, one thing we forgot to bring up, and this kind of goes back into uh, you know the symbolism. Uh, now. There was a point in time where that where Scarabri was was um, abandoned, and I know that there was a lot of interesting uh, parallelism uh, parallels between that and uh, Egyptian symbolism with the exit and uh, the lack of reasoning behind it as far as them leaving. Yes, uh, and the the Dogen concept of their teachers leaving. Also, there are parallels to the deliberate covering over of Gobekli Tepe. In that Gobekli Tepe, we know it was deliberately and carefully covered. Some of the sites on Orkney Island, it's clear they were deliberately covered. Um, now, one of the cosmological terms that relates to the structures we see at Gobekli Tepe is arc. Now, you know, biblically, there's an arc on the side of a mountain near Ararat. Well, Gobekli Tepe is on the side of a mountain near Ararat. Um, the term also applies to the shape that's being created on Orkney Island by these, these megalithic sites. It, one of the term is arc. But another word, another meaning for the word arc is in, in ancient Egypt is to cover over. And the symbols that are used to write that word in the Egyptian language spell out visually the process that happens every day with um, a, a Jewish Torah in every temple in the world. That after they're done reading the instructional portion for the day, the Torah scroll is um, um rolled up and covered over carefully and placed back inside a cabinet called an Aron HaKodesh, which gets abbreviated to ARC. So it looks to me like part of what was going on with the covering over these sites was a ritual statement that says, look, this was an instructional site. It, its instructional purpose was completed. We are now ritually covering it over to indicate that. Uh, at Quebec, at uh, Scarabray, there are other other indications of what was going on there. They left some symbolic messages that give us a clue as to why they left and where they might have gone, actually. I don't discuss that in the book, but I learned from our visit there that there are hints as to where they might have gone. And I'm guessing that would be discussed in a future book? Uh, yeah, it might be. Or the, some of these things that get discussed you know, eventually in, in inter interviews that don't actually make it into a book, but you know, they'll, they'll turn up on the, the Jeopardy game version of the books, I guess. <laughs> and I wanted to at least be able to segue into uh, the, the, the last uh, short segment um, and you know, just be able to close things out where we can kind of leave things at a quote-unquote cliffhanger so that we can talk about the next book uh, the next time it comes out and have a nice segue. Uh, when people left uh, Scarabray, they left quite suddenly. Uh, where where did they go and in what manner did they leave? Like, We're not sure. We know that uh, they had enough warning that rather than abandoning the animals that they domesticated animals they had, the farm animals on the island, they held a final feast. Um, at least 400 animals were killed and maybe a thousand people ate at this final feast. Um, and when the feast was done, the site was covered over. But before it was covered over, they carefully placed bones all around the site. Um, not any bone, but just the thigh bones of the animals, the tibias. And um, there's symbolism to that. Some of the symbolism we'll get into in the upcoming book about what a thigh represents. There are um, fundamental meanings to the concept of a thigh. Uh, but an Egyptian word for thigh is pronounced like a word that means to leave under duress or to depart under duress. So we can we can tell from the symbolism of the thighs that they had to they, they weren't leaving because they wanted to they left because they had to, but not had to like get out of a uh, burning house. They had enough time to think about what they were doing and to plan what they were doing. Um, now my sense is they they 
descended some of them descended down into the UK they went into Scotland into Ireland into uh, Great Britain and there are indications that that happened the next book sort of carries that forward um, there's an Irish myth that a group that uh, that I track down from Scarabray um, was forced to leave there in the early centuries AD and the Irish myth is there are two myths one says they left across the Eastern Sea or the Western Sea the other one says that they went to the underworld well the Maori book quotes a, a myth from New Zealand that says that this a matching group came from across the Eastern Sea at about that same period of time and an ancient name for New Zealand was meant um, first circle of the underworld so the Maori perspective really upholds both of those Irish myths I mean or, or we've got the cyclical happening of the housing bubble back in prehistoric times <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well but I, I think that you can see the trail of these groups um, in the Americas you know mm. you see it down in Virginia with Native American tribes you see it with the Hopi Indians you see it in Central and South America you may see it on um, Easter Island you see them in Polynesia uh, there's they may have been stragglers along the way here who sort of jump had jumping off points at other places and uh sorry alex did you want to oh, add something well this has been probably one of the the cooler interviews we've done it's definitely up there in in uh, you know in in the top of you know top experiences i'm going to have and over the next couple of months and unless my wife decides to say that she's pregnant which you know that's good for everybody um but it, you you've expanded uh, expanded my mind and, and I've learned a lot, you know, a lot talking directly to the source himself. And uh, I would like to say again, thank you very much for taking uh, the time this afternoon out of your busy schedule to 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 sit down and talk with uh, with our show and and uh, the the gentleman here as well as with our viewers. Thank you very much well, for coming thank on. Thank you the very show. much for yeah. Thank you very much for having me on. Um, if people want to try to reach me, they can find me on Facebook. I joke that they shouldn't confuse me with all the other Laird Scrantons. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were quite hard to find, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a LairdScranton.com uh, website, but it's a fan site. Uh, the contact tab there does reach me. I get an email and I'll answer a message if it's sent that way. Or you can contact me through my publisher, Inner Traditions, or through Simon & Schuster. Well, that's that's fantastic. Uh, you know, Laird, I'm going to play our outro song for you, uh, which uh, it's different than our usual one, which uh, we used to have it from The Dread, but um, the, the band uh, tried to monetize it on YouTube, even though it's a, a creative, like, you know, free-to-air, creative commons, no problem. So uh, we actually went with uh, Broke for Free, and the song is called Spellbound. Great. It's a little bit more chill than our usual one, but I kind of like it. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to uh, post this on our website as soon as I can within the next day or two. Uh, and I'm going to, uh, you know, try and see how much word I can get out about the book while I'm planning for Christmas. Hopefully we'll put a, we can put a link in. No, we, well, the links are in the, the in the show notes already. Good. So, uh, Laird, thank you very much. And I just wanted to say uh, you're, you're welcome back anytime. And... I hope you have a wonderful holidays and new year. Well, great. Um, if there are, is there, if there's any additional material I can explain for you or question I can resolve for you or research, let me know and I'd be happy to do it. It would be my absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye. Have right, a good night. So what do you think of that?
Staring at the sun.